Yes, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to start today's uh, second single cell initiative webinar uh, at HUPA, and uh, we welcome our first speaker, Vadim Demichev. He is uh, going to represent the, the Charité uh, Hospital at Berlin, and the title of his talk, uh, Using Slice Pass Up to Maximize Proteome Sensitivity. Vadim, all to you. Thank you for the participating. Uh, thank you, Bogdan, for introduction and uh, many thanks for inviting me to speak here. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, how we can use our optimized technology on broker instruments, which we call slice passive, to boost single cell proteomics. So um, here's the plan of my talk. And uh, first, I'll briefly discuss what actually determines the performance of any data independent acquisition method then switch to introducing our slice passive technology how it works and how it's specifically used for single cell proteomics i will show some results and uh, finally i want to discuss uh, what we can do if we combine super sensitive mass spec technology with uh, something normally not used for single cell proteomics like a microflow LC system. So, um, briefly about DIA. So, the way it works is the mass spec repeatedly cycles through a predefined set of Q1 quadrupole isolation windows. So um, when a particular window is acquired, a precursors which fall into this window are being fragmented, whereas all other precursors fly away to the vacuum pump. And uh, then it switches from one window to another window to another window and so forth. And this is a cycle. And then it repeats the cycle again, again, and again. So typically during the uh, illusion time of a, of, of a typical peptide, what you'll see is that many data points are being acquired. So in contrast to DDA, uh, where you get MS1 profile and a uh, single spectrum, what you obtain in DIA is uh, elution profiles for all the fragment ions of a peptide. And this helps a lot in identifying peptides and also in quantifying them. Uh, now, if we look at uh, the history of proteomics, then uh, not so long ago, and this was already DIA, the state of the art was identifying and quantifying around 4,000 human proteins from a human cell lysate. And this was with two hour uh, nanoflow chromatographic gradient. Now, in 2021, a couple of years ago, we reached about 5,000 proteins from a five minute gradient. So, this is actually a better data quality than six years before that, and with about 20 times higher throughput. So, tremendous gain in performance. And we still keep gaining. So, we um, gradually address limitations of DA proteomics, and they just start disappearing, many of them, like uh, the need to use a spectral library incompatibility with multiplexing. And uh, now it's very applicable to a wide range of problems. So, and a wide, wide range of experiments. And what I would like to highlight is that this progress in, in technology in proteomics in general, it's driven by three things. So the first one is data processing methods, particularly important for DIA, which generates very complex data. Then it's uh, appearance like of new, uh, more fast, more sensitive mass specs, and also C systems, which allow new things. And finally, it's new ways to operate the mass spec, new mass spec technologies. And this is the main topic of uh, my today's presentation. Some time ago, we uh, introduced a software solution for processing DA proteomics data, which we call DIAN, Data Independent Acquisition by Neural Networks. And we also published quite a number of technology papers based on that. And uh, since um, its release, it's grown quite popular in the community. So that right now, it seems to be by far the most cited uh, software for DIA. And uh, what we do is uh, we also focus on how we can improve uh, the work of the, the operation of the mass spec. And uh, we, in the same time, adapt the software to process the new data. So the initial highlight of our software solution was that we wanted to address the throughput problem of proteomics. And this, uh, the work started back in 2017 when something like a 30-minute gradient was considered super fast. 
and uh, the main gain was with actually with with very fast methods. So this is a bit later data, but it illustrates the same concept. Where with a medium link gradient nowadays, uh, so this is Ava Sap sixty SPD. It's about twenty one minutes. We got moderate advantage of alternative software, whereas with uh, very fast gradients like two hundred SPD, we got huge advantage. And the primary reason for that was because we were using this neural network based approach for distinguishing true signals from noise, which just allows to do it very finely. So no matter how complex the data is, we can confidently identify peptides. Now, one thing I wanted to highlight about uh, DA proteomics in general is uh, such a property as MSMS duty cycle. That is the proportion of ions that are produced by iron source, which actually get fragmented. Because fragmentation is uh, the basis of identifying peptides. And uh, you do need to see multiple fragments to identify a peptide, because otherwise it's just not confident. And uh, this is determined by MSMS duty cycle. And uh, it's very easy to calculate. So for DIA method, which is without a Teams device, without an ability, it's just one divided by the number of DIA windows. So typically what we see with the regular DIA methods, it's uh, say usually between 20 and 100 windows, which means duty cycle between one and 5%. So it's very low. It means that uh, almost all lines are being discarded. So they're not being fragmented. This, uh, the information that they could potentially contain is being lost, which is not good. Now, if we think in general how uh, the performance of DIA method is determined, so of course the sensitivity is, is maybe the main factor. And what we need is ability to detect enough fragment ions and also ability to detect those fragment ions uh, with good signal to noise ratio. So of course, high injection amount helps a lot. So we just want there to be enough of the peptide. And uh, Low flow rates also help because they allow for high concentration of the peptide at the ion source. But uh, MSMS duty cycle is another major determinant. And uh, typically, if you want to optimize the mass spec for sensitivity, what we go for is wide isolation windows because since the duty cycle is one divided by number of isolation windows and we have some predefined precursor mass range, we can cover the same mass range with less windows, which are wider. Now, there is another factor, however, in determining the performance of the mass spec, and this is selectivity. And uh, this is something quite specific to DIA, so not, much, not as much problem in DDA, but in DIA, what happens is that you have those wide precursor ion isolation windows and multiple peptides get fragmented at the same time. Some of those coelute, and what happens is that uh, often there is a situation when uh, signals for uh, signals of fragment ions they just sum of signals for multiple peptides co-fragmented and co -eluting. and the software it struggles to distinguish so it cannot understand very often whether it's a uh, one peptide or another peptide or maybe it's both peptides. So in order to improve selectivity, what we need is a better separation in some dimension. It can be retention time, it can be eye mobility, and again, precursor mass dimension. So uh, optimizing for selectivity, we typically want narrow isolation windows because less peptides are being co-fragmented together. And to cover the same precursor mass range, this automatically means we need more windows. More windows means lower duty cycle, so optimizing for sensitivity and optimizing for selectivity is, is the opposite. So each uh, DIA method is uh, basically a balance between those, and this balance might shift depending on the sample type and the amount of sample. Now, this selectivity problem is uh, more severe with short gradients, because if you have a longer gradient, your peptide typically well, well separated in retention time dimension. No longer the case with shorter gradients. So the, the shorter the gradient, the lower the peak capacity, the higher the result in data complexity. Now, here comes uh, the 
DA passive technology. So how this helps with both sensitivity and selectivity. So I'm not going to get into technical detail, but uh, we'll briefly introduce uh, the concept in how the data looks like. So you have the mass dimension and you have uh, the immobility dimension measured in so-called one oka zero units. And the way the mass spec operates, it accumulates precursor ions for a specified amount of time, say 100 milliseconds, and then it releases them depending on their ion mobility gradually. So first precursor ions here where these ion mobility values are being released and goes down. So this release also happens, say, in 100 milliseconds. And uh, the mass spec can adjust the Q1 precursor isolation window depending on the ion mobility currently being released. So uh, when you're releasing uh, precursor ions with this range of ion mobilities, the Q1 isolation window can be here. Then it's here, and then it's here. So it goes like this. And uh, this uh, release of precursor ions is called a single frame. And they can be multiple frames in a cycle. So typically, this is uh, how a typical uh, DA passive acquisition scheme looks like and has eight frames. Each frame has a free DA passive for isolation windows. And uh, the windows are the size 25 Daltons. And uh, how, how this approach is beneficial in comparison to regular non iron mobility enabled DA. Well, the first, of course, is that uh, ion mobility separation just improves selectivity. And uh, it's a several fold improvement. And the other consequence of that is that since selectivity is so good now, which is again particularly good for fast gradients, we can afford shifting the balance between selectivity and sensitivity, which means that we can afford use using larger precursor ion isolation windows, less, less total, total windows. And this automatically improves sensitivity. Now, another benefit is that uh, the duty cycle is calculated not as one divided by the number of DIA windows, but rather one divided by the number of DIA frames. So in this case, it would be uh, 1 over 8, which is 12.5%, which is very high. If, if you compare it to regular DIA. So this is a further boost, boost in sensitivity. So overall, uh, DIA passive uh, boosts both selectivity and sensitivity. And uh, some time ago, we collaborated with uh, Nisivsky lab and also Rausa lab and Bruca. And um, we represented a computational pipeline based on frag pipe and Diana, which is capable of analyzing DA passive data with quite nice results. For example, when we reanalyzed the original data from Matthias Mann lab, uh, what we saw is that uh, we could identify and quantify over 5,000 proteins from 200 sample per day of a SEP method. And uh, so it's a HeLa 200 nanogram. So it, it's, it's capable of quite uh, high throughput and at the same time, quite high sensitivity. Uh, now let's talk about uh, super sensitive uh, proteomics in general and why we need it. And uh, what I would like to highlight is that it's not just sensitivity we need, but also speed. Because in applications like single cell proteomics, what you want uh, is to have uh, high statistical power and also be able to construct machine learning models which uh, connect uh, the proteomic signature to different kinds of phenotypes. And this all requires high numbers of single cells acquired, which means large scale, which means high throughput. And uh, there's also another exciting application, uh, which is deep visual proteomics by Matthias Mann lab, uh, also now Fabian Kosher lab. And um, the idea is basically that uh, very thin, maybe a sub single cell tissue slices are being dissected by the laser, and uh, individual pieces uh, of the tissue are being analyzed by the mass spec. And this allows to special do special proteomics of a tissue down to single cell resolution. So, this also both super high sensitivity, but uh, at the same time benefits tremendously from being able to run this in high throughput. So, throughput is very important. And one of the ways we've tried to address it is with multiplexing. 
So we in a local collaboration with Nikolai Slavov lab, we and uh, also Bruka. What we're able to do is uh, to multiplex samples with free plex using Amtrak. And this works fine with DIA. So basically, you get the same benefit of multiplexing that you get with DDA, which is throughput, and uh, data completeness is also better. So with a 30-minute nylon flow method and 15-minute active gradient, um, we're able to get about 1,000 proteins from single cells. But we also thought, can we optimize the performance of the instrument itself? And uh, here, the basic idea is that uh, do we really need Q1 windows to be non-overlapping? So this is typically how DIA is done. Uh, the regular DIA definitely doesn't make any sense to overlap them, except in different cycles. Well, this is this is a different story. Uh, but uh, in DIA passive, can we overlap them? And are there any benefits in that? And it turns out there. So the simplest possible uh, way to actually measure DIA passive is what we call a one-frame method. And we have this charge to precursor cloud in mass to I mobility dimension. And we just adjust gradually uh, the Q1 bounds to cover the whole precursor ion cloud, depending on the mobility value. So it's a very simple method. And uh, we implemented a, slice, a, a module in the end to support this. Now, there are, of course, other alternatives. So this is great. It, it's 100% MS MS duty cycle. No ions are being lost. Every single ion is being fragmented. Uh, selectivity is, of course, not perfect. Uh, mass selectivity is uh, really not good. But at the same time, we have high mobility selectivity. So it's kind of OK. And I will show benchmarks later. Uh, we can also go to fairly high selectivity while having also decent sensitivity and what we call multi-frame methods. And that's what we call slice. And that's hence the name slice passive. Slice precursor ion space in several slices and cover each slice with a single frame. And uh, another alternative is a variation of a two-frame method. So we have just two frames and we can move the boundary between those uh, from cycle to cycle. So one cycle is one boundary, another cycle is another boundary. And this confers extra selectivity because the software can figure out, okay, I see a fragment trace, what's the, where the likely precursor mass is. So this uh, all works with a standard broker software. And uh, we also released Diane version, which can process that. And there is uh, an improved support for Win Diane for this in works currently. So uh, everyone can uh, download uh, Diane and uh, try this on the instrument. Now, uh, before I go to benchmarks, I wanted to highlight one technical advantage of uh, doing protonics in this way. And uh, that is that there is no dead time uh, when the quadrupole is being switched from one setting to another setting. So here's a mass MS spectrum of DA passive. And uh, you can clearly see, so, so here where the DA passive windows are, so they are unfragmented precursors fly in. And you can see the rising density here and here. <laughs> and uh, what you can also clearly see is that when the quadruple is switching, there is just nothing. Nothing comes to the detector. And uh, this is obviously inefficient. At the same time with slice passive, we move the, the the quadruple window just a bit, and the Bruker software apparently figures out, okay, this is a very small change in the quadruple setting. We don't need to switch it off. So you get a continuous spectrum and uh, no ions are lost because of it. Now, um, let's consider the benchmarks. So um, this is uh, uh, the first test we did, and uh, this is actually not something you would typically use for single cell proteomics. This is analytical flow system. It's purely to benchmark the mass spec. And um, it's also great in, in terms of optimizing the methods because it's incredibly robust. And um, it's just, just like point of reference to, to compare different uh, acquisition schemes. So what we did here, we analyzed uh, KF62 standard. Uh, so it's a commercial digest uh, of a human cell line with uh, one frame, which is 100% duty cycle, two frame, 50%, four frame, 25%, and regular DA passive, 
12.5%. And uh, what we saw is that with the bulk sample, so one microgram load, in terms of total protein numbers, DIA passive is actually the best. So size passive is somewhat behind. And uh, when we go lower, they kind of become equal. And with uh, very low injection amounts, 10 nanograms on a high flow system, slice passive one frame is overwhelmingly better than DA passive. But we also noticed that uh, the numbers of proteins quantified precisely with 10% CV or less was the best for one frame slice passive, even with bulk injections. And it's overwhelmingly better with uh, low injection amounts. So it's a lot, a lot more precise. And this is for two reasons. So the main reason is uh, because the signal, MSMS signal, is just stronger. It's less noisy. And the second reason is that we repeat this one frame several times in a row, in this case five. And it means that the actual number of data points per peak at MS2, one, at MS2 level is uh, roughly 30 for this run. So it's a huge number of data points per peak and means high precision. And uh, this is... Uh, Actually, amazing data are acquired by our collaborators. So it's uh, actual single cells. And this is a nanoflow system. I think it's quite fast, 15 minute gradient. And uh, we see a, a quite a boost in terms of total protein numbers with slice passive. But most importantly, we see that the variation between single cells is dramatically reduced. So here, the average uh, correlation between cells is like 0 0.91, and here it's 0 0.97 with slice passive. Now we started thinking, okay, we have super sensitive mass spec method. Can we do something uh, so far unheard of, like uh, analyzing single cells with a microflow C? And uh, we thought, okay, uh, what immediately came to mind is EVASAP 200 SPD method, which is to microliter a minute. So it's a quite fast, uh, quite robust system. And we thought, why not? Let's try. So we uh, first measured a uh, 200 picogram HeLa standard. So this is now in-house, it's not commercial. And uh, what we saw, we got about 1.4 thousand uh, proteins detected with a size passive. Also, CV values were quite good at 14% median on the protein level, and we validated uh, 200 picograms versus uh, 1,000 picograms. And we saw that correlate well, and this kind of indicates that we are quantifying what we think we're quantifying. And uh, these were very encouraging numbers to us because uh, remember I showed several slides before with Plex DIA, we got uh, with a nanoflow system, something like 1,000 proteins per cell. And that was actually at the lower throughput, about maybe twice lower throughput. So this was very encouraging. And uh, just a week ago, we got first data with actual single cells. So again, 200 SPD, so HeLa, single HeLa cells. And we haven't yet got any data to actually make DAA refined library. So this is with the public spectral library analysis, uh, 12 uh, single HeLa cells prepped in cell in one. And the very, very first attempt of our collaborators to do that. And it's it, it yields us 750 proteins on average. So based on what we know about spectral libraries, we would expect this very same data to produce just over 1,000 proteins on average per single cell if we properly refine the library. And also, there's still a lot of room towards optimizing the instrument based on some, in terms of sample prep and also the mass spec because it was very, very first try for us. Uh, finally, to wrap this up, uh, I want to just mention that uh, there is uh, lots of lots of room in which uh, to move forward. And uh, one, of course, is that we could combine Plex DIA with Slice Passive. Nothing prevents it. It works just fine. Uh, then um, what we'll also hear later today is that uh, several groups have worked a lot towards optimizing nanoflow systems. And now we have very high throughput nanoflow systems. And uh, this, of course, will be a lot more sensitive than using microflow. So we would also expect slice passive to be highly beneficial for uh, nanoflow, fast single cell proteomics. Uh, EVASEP 500 SPD has been released recently. So it's uh, four microliters a minute. 
and it's of course less sensitive than 200 SPD, but uh, we would expect it to give reasonable numbers still. So it might be very good for many single cell applications in combination with slice passive. And uh, finally, on the computational side, there's still room to, for improvement in terms of how we generate spectral libraries to analyze the data. And um, we have a Diane version in, in works, which uh, gives higher performance specifically with slice passive. So we improved a slice passive module in Diane. Finally, I would like to uh, thank our collaborators. So first of all, my lab and also uh, our institute. So many people contributed to these projects I mentioned today and our colleagues from MDC, Kosher Lab and Zelbach Lab from uh, University of Michigan. So the lab of Alexey Nisivsky, uh, Slavov Lab in Northeastern University in Boston and our colleagues from Buka. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vadim. It was a great talk. I'm glad to see improvements in uh, uh, DIA mode, in, in uh, achievements on the single cell. It was very good uh, to, to hear uh, advancements. Uh, please, everyone, if you do have any questions, you can put in the Q&A and I will read them uh, for Vadim. And uh, I don't see any yet so far. But I have a general question. Uh, yeah, I will start myself first. Uh, Vadim, you know, you did mention that you know for the big statistical analysis later on the single cell level, we will need to have some kind of large numbers uh, of the cells. In your opinion, what would be the? Of course, it will grow with automation, with the more speeds we have, more sample preparation, etc. But in your kind of current state opinion, what would be the minimal set of? single cell analysis that you would count to be useful for the statistical judgments on the results? Well, I mean, we do know that even hundreds of cells still can give very valuable insights. So uh, this and, and there are works already on this. So, but at the same time, we also know that uh, single cell RNA sequencing benefits tremendously from measuring tens of thousands and more cells. And uh, we can say now that we do have proteomic capabilities to do that. And uh, maybe many things need to be optimized on technical level. And also there's issue of how to do this in a cost-effective way. Uh, but at the same time, this is definitely the future of uh, single cell proteomics to move to thousands and tens of thousands of cells. Good, thank you. Okay, there are, are a couple of questions uh, I could read for you. Can a Diane regular version can do Plex DIA for Silac labeled samples directly, or does it require customization to include Silac into the? Um, so the it is it is possible to use regular DIA in for Silac and uh, also works with slice passive. Just one needs to supply um, a certain set of commands, and they're not yet properly described on the GitHub Diane page. So just please email me and I'll send to you a description of how to use it for Silac. Good. Uh, uh, we have limited time, but I'm going to the next talk. Uh, sorry, question. The interesting talk, thank you, was the microflow with 5.6 minute gradient heal. How many data points peak uh, are being acquired and uh, how does CV look like? Uh, roughly eight. Uh, so for 200 picograms, the CV is 14% median protein level, but this is determined uh, primarily um, by the sensitivity. So the less you inject, typically the worse the CVs you get. So if we inject a lot, it will be very good CVs. And so it's passive uh, specifically, even if, I mean, if compared to DIA passive, DIA passive will be fine with this method. But slice so passive, has uh, this full change more data points at MS2 level, simply because we repeat one frame multiple times. And uh, this means that the, 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 the issue of data points per peak is effectively completely eliminated. Okay, thank you, Vadim. Uh, next question from Mark and Access Lecture Later. Yes, everybody could uh, uh, see this lecture later because it's been recorded. The Hupa web page will put it after the uh, making the video, probably in a week or, or so, and it will be uh, available on the Hupa website. The last question for you, uh, Avadim, did uh, you look at the robustness of the protein quant using your improvements? I mean, do you have a more a prototypic peptides attributed to the protein quantitation? So I would think it's a ratio of number of prototypic peptides per protein is uh, very roughly comparable. 
and in general what i'm quoting is protein groups but these numbers are very close to the numbers of proteins identified with the unique prototypic peptides typically in da okay uh thanks vadim uh that was the last question i would ask you uh, due to the time limits it was very interesting to talk thank you very much for your presentation and then anybody who would like to have a specific question as to vadim please welcome to send him email because clearly the more questions could rise later thank you vadim thank you. and we're going to the next uh, uh, presenter for today it's Manuel Matzinger. Uh, he is representing the uh, Research Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna. And his talk today would be high throughput single cell proteomics using ultra short gradients and wide window acquisition to reach unprecedented proteome coverage and quantitative accuracy. Uh, please, Manuel, uh, your, your stage. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yes, it's a pleasure to introduce you to some of the research done in the single cell field in the Mechtel group. So I'll start by shortly introducing to you what we are actually doing. Um, so we are embedded in the Campus Manuel Biocenter as a tech hub group that is dedicated to method development and we focus on not only on single cell proteomics, but we are also doing protein cross linking. Um, we are still doing a lot of tests on chromatographic columns and mass spec acquisition methods. And in another project, we also do urine based proteomics for biomarker detection in chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> and no method, I'm sorry, no method, of course, has a value with other applications. So, um, in terms of single cell proteomics, we are collaborating with groups on campus to understand early brain development and tumorogenesis, as well as uh, stem cell differentiation. So to have a, a powerful approach for single cell proteomics, we need a very integrated uh, workflow. Um, and the very first step, of course, is sample preparation. If sample preparation um, is sufficient, then also um, all the rest can work, right? And there are tons of different possibilities from um, working in 384 well plates to capillaries or um, the protea chip, for example, that is, that is known um, with the Saturn one And there are later we have multiplex workflows around. However, all of them have um, a common need that is to be as loss free as possible, to be fast and reproducible. After sample preparation, of course, uh, chromatographic separation is needed. There are different column types um, around. I will talk later about this. Um, micropillar columns that are very um, new to us in, in our lab. And here again, the needs are, of course, having high throughput, a good separation power, and longevity. After that, data acquisition is usually done either with orbit traps or TOF detectors. Those are the most common ones. And of course, eye mobility as a complementary separation um, will help to improve signal to noise and reduce complexity of the, of the resulting spectrum. Common needs are again here uh, quantitative accuracy, speed, sensitivity, resolution, and data completeness. And last but not least, of course, we need an application. So, usually, you're interested in investigating cellular heterogeneity. Um, so, for example, you can try to understand tumor genesis or do some tissue mapping. So with this, I already complete my very quick introduction and um, start in with what we are actually doing. Um, and the first step, as mentioned before, is sample preparation that is in our lab mainly done within the Saturn one robot. So for those of you that might not yet know it, um, that's a peak lipid dispensing system allowing for um, isolation of individual cells in a glass capillary based on parameters as pattern elongation and diameter, but also um, with a fluorescent staining. So for example, you can differentiate from life from dead cells with that. And once all these settings are uh, set, then um, everything of our workflow from cell isolation to lysis, digestion, and incubation is done within this robot, within the free at well plate. Of course, thanks to elevated temperature during lysis and digestion, we have an uh, evaporation issue, and we overcome this by a constant hydration with water in an automated manner using the Saturn one to keep the volume at the same level. 
after incubation, we acidify and um, also uh, supplement some DMSO. This improves our solubility of especially hydrophobic peptides. We can then place this plate directly to the outer sampler of our LCMS system. So we recently uh, published this work and here are some selected results of that, just to show you here the effect of the sample transfer. So um, when transferring our single cell sample to either a tube uh, or an outer sample glass vial, we yield in much less protein IDs as compared to doing no transfer at all and um, having the sample all the time in the same well, never removing it. A similar effect is also uh, visible with the different trypsin amount added. So for single cell proteomics, we need a kind of a high excess of trypsin compared to the protein amount present to have a sufficient digestion that you see that more is actually more. So with four and five nanograms, more proteins were identified compared to three nanograms. And if we split this and add this 4.5 nanograms in two portions, this effect is even stronger, yielding the best protein coverage here. And in the last panel, I'd like to um, highlight the effect of DMSO supplementation. And you can see that especially here in the region of peptides that have a high retention time, the presumably the more hydrophobic ones, we have um, less sample losses and therefore more IDs. And after optimization of uh, many of these workflow steps, of course, what's always of interest is um, what's the protein coverage in the end and what's the dynamic range that we can reach. And in our case, we're able to have uh, four orders of magnitude in dynamic range. But of course, the most abundant fraction here are contaminants like cavities or the uh, artificially added trypsin, right? But the four orders of magnitude are already quite um, convincing for us and um, impressive, uh, very impressive to us. We are, of course, still here in this range of the higher abundant proteins within the proteome. So this is something, something where we still need to um, improve sensitivity to go um, deeper into the protein here in the future. Well, for example, it was only the first step, right, in this um, holistic approach. So this means we do also need to think about data acquisition and data analysis tools. So we also compared the standard and DDA approach. These are all 20 minutes ingredients, by the way, with white window acquisition and dire. White window acquisition was um, recently introduced by our lab and others, by the Calico as well. Um, which it is a DDA method with a wider isolation window to um, co-isolate and co-fragment several precursors at once. And this helps to boost um, protein numbers. But this is also true for the DDA, even better actually. And in case throughput matters, then another approach we have was this very short five minute gradient here with a method called MS1 here. So this means that no fragmentation was performed at all. We use only retention time and MS1 spectra to identify our proteins. This is something that was um, published by Mark Ivanov uh, two years ago. And here the coverage is not as good anymore as it was with um, the longer gradient, but still four five minute gradient. Um, it's quite um, impressive and yeah, as mentioned before, if yes, this is the way to go. Another thing is, of course, to compare different data analysis tools. And here you see the comparison of a conventional search engine, which is Amazon Mundo, that was developed back in 2014 in our group, and Camaris, that is very new and artificial intelligence based. And um, you can see that from the same raw files, we identify um, much more proteins, close to double the number. And those the overlap is very good, so we can re-identify more or less all proteins that we found with Amander, plus close to 400 additional ones. All right, so you saw here before that wide window acquisition was actually boosting our ID numbers, so we also 
investigated this um, more in depth, and this is a preprint that we also published recently. Um, and here we combine this wide window acquisition with uh, microcular array columns that have a rather high uh, peak capacity and reduced carryover and also very sharp peaks that allow for uh, also longer gradients if needed without dilution of the signal. Wide window acquisition usually for us here means that the isolation wave is for Thompson. So we intentionally co isolate several precursors generated by the complex spectra. But thanks to Camaris, we can then identify up to 11 peptides per MS2 spectrum. And this is, of course, um, great because without having to measure more spectra, we can identify more. And while this was initially also tested, more or less tested for standard proteomics, we then also extended this work to low input proteomics. And you can see here that for 10 nanograms of input and actually also above, this isolation window of four Thomson that I mentioned before performed best. However, for lower inputs like one nanogram or 250 picograms, the window can be opened up more and more. For 250 picograms, we are already at 12 Thomson optimal isolation window. And this results in excellent identification rates, meaning the number of TSMs per MS2 spectrum is still um, above 100% with this isolation wave of 12 or 150 picograms, which um, is close to a single cell input. And we then tested this entire approach, so a combination of wide window acquisition and this uh, micropillar columns, also with a collaboration partner on immunoprecipitated SMARC-5 um, protein to find novel interaction partners. And here in panel C, you can see the original workflow with a standard packed bed um, PEPMAP column and a standard DDA method and the manner as a software. And in panel D, you can see now the, uh, the new workflow. And yeah, obviously, the number of potential interactors was very much improved. But then not, not only that, well, if you look to panel E, all the known interactions that were found with the Amanda workflow were we identified with the Camaris workflow, plus additional ones, whereas those that were unknown and that are obviously more the less confident ones, they were um, exclusively found here by the Amanda workflow. So to sum this slide up um, with this wide video acquisition and the new software and the new column, we have synergy combined synergistic effects to boost more and more our peptide and protein ID numbers um, up to very um, convincing levels. So however, before I showed you that DA actually uh, showed better numbers for the real single cells, so we um, go back to look into this. And you can hear the top row C uh, data for the wide video acquisition and in the bottom for DIA. So here two cell lines were compared. You see that both strategies um, allowed to separate them in the PCA nicely. However, when you look here into this data completeness graph, you see that um, less than 80% of all peptides were quantified across all five replicates that were measured, whereas close to 100% were quantified in all replicates with DIRM. So this is uh, one of the obvious advantages of a DIA method, and especially if you think for um, higher throughput uh, later, like hundreds of cells, this becomes very important, of course. The downside is for DIA that the coefficient variation here is higher, as the duty cycle is um, longer, so we have less data points per peak, yielding in roughly 25% median CV and only 15 here for wide window. So the main problem, of course, is, is for that is the duty cycle. So that's why we felt, okay, if we can do wide window acquisition for DDA, 
And we can also do it, of course, for DIA. So we tested to open up the um, window for a DIA method. Here in the left panel, you see data from DIA N, and the right panel, you see it for Spectrum Out 17, but it's the same raw files. And surprisingly, although we open up up to 100 of them of a set, still the ID numbers are more or less um, similar and very close. So even the very complex spectra that we generate can still be uh, successfully analyzed. And since we were optimized for ID numbers, the best uh, option here was 40 M of a set with dia N, and with spectrum now it was even 50. So we then checked what's about dynamic range now. Is it better? And indeed, um, this is now at least five orders of magnitude and with high inputs, of course, even more. So we improved compared to our previous setting. And I also have to mention that, of course, this is a high throughput method. So um, now we are doing everything in a 10 minute gradient instead of a 20 minute gradient without sacrificing uh, dynamic range or ID numbers. And to show you how this setting looks like, um, we have uh, now used here again a standard FAPMAP column that is, however, with a narrow inner diameter of only 50 micrometers, and that is then connected to an emitter without any transfer line. So to make um, ways as short, flow paths as short as possible and maintain narrow peaks. To improve sensitivity as good as we can, doing this gradient, the flow rate is very low at only 100 nanometers per minute. Whereas before and after for loading and equilibration, flow rate is high at 500 nanometers per minute. And this is work that was very recently, uh, two or three days ago, uh, put on bioarchive by us. And this yields then to a strategy where we can um, inject up to 100 samples a day, depending on if we do it in direct injection or if we have to do it. So that injection takes a bit longer because the loading is a bit slower. And if we now focus again the 250 grams, we are able to um, identify 2,600 protein groups within this 10 minute gradients. And roughly half of those, or a bit more than that, was quantified with a CV of lower than 10%. And if you compare this to the trap in the loop output, you see that we lose some IDs to so six um, decreases here to two, two. So 2,200 protein groups identified and 1,100 of those quantified with a low CV. So of course, this um, quantification here is still something that um, could be better for us in future, but considering this very short gradient, we're still very happy with this result. And this was a collaboration work with Ron Schenk from Thermo. So we also had the chance to compare this entire workflow across both labs to see is it reproducible? Can it be done in both labs? And you see here that for, for the healer injection, we yield in roughly the same number of protein groups, peptide groups, and also the same for the half maximum of, of the peaks at around four seconds in both labs. We also compared then to the micropillar column that I showed you before. And our high group of methods surprisingly did not work on that column. So we tackled then also the longer gradient with 20 minutes and which the entire MS method that was published by the lab of Evan Cho. So here we were back again at roughly 2000 protein groups, but with the shorter um, 10 minute gradient, 200 samples per day, we are at the same level. So there's no trade off in, in lost protein IDs. Also, when directly comparing the same column here, the uh, 100 samples per day method to the wish dia method or longer gradient. So of course, these are um, 250 picogram healer data only. So um, let me also show you here how this looks like for real single cells. 
Um, so again, Hilo cells are prepared in the free edge well plate as uh, described in my first slides. And here we uh, yielded in roughly 1,800 protein groups, but we reducibly identified from uh, the single cells. And of course, um, data competence is also important uh, again here. So we check how much could be found in all the uh, 10 replicates that are measured here. And you can see that um, close to everything was identified in at least half of the replicates. And 1,200 of these 1,800 were identified in all 10 replicates. And also the number of quantified proteins is close to the identified number, which was, um, of course, also important because in the end, you want to do quantification always. So to wrap this up, uh, what I showed to you here is a semi-automated reproducible one-pot workflow for sample preparation in volumes of one microliter that are low but still easy to handle for everyone without um, specialized instrumentation. So we actually also tested this workflow with multi-channel pipettes and without the certain one, it still works. Um, and thanks to no sample transfer, it's um, Loss, a loss less workflow with an improved recovery thanks to storage with 5% of DMSO and thanks to low drying of the sample at any stage due to high humidity while doing the digestion and water supplementation. But then it would boost ID numbers using wide range acquisition and intelligent data analysis of chimeric spectra, yielding in ID rates of more than 100%. Uh, and boosting pattern IDs by more than 100%. And from a single cell, we were able to identify at least this 1,700 protein groups without any um, carrier or without matching between ones. So in a pure label free workflow. And what I did not show to you here, but just to mention it also is uh, with the same um, combination of column and wide range acquisition, we were able to um, have a coverage of more than 10,000 proteins from a single shotgun experiment with standard input amounts. For throughput, we then also boosted that one to, to go up to 100 samples and also meaning 100 cells per day by using this wide window dye method and 10 minute gradients with fast washing without suffering from reproducibility or low watt coverage, and we were able to quantify more than 90% of all protein groups. Yeah, and these short gradients are also, of course, of importance to improve sensitivity because there is no um, dilution and um, sharper and therefore higher peaks. With this, I would like to thank the Protein Chemistry Service Facility as well as the Protein Technology Hub, and especially Rupert, who um, did a lot of the work for the wide window acquisition on the most of the work for the 100 samples per day um, strategy. And Elizabeth, a former master student of mine who did most of the work in sample preparation. So she is now uh, in Mannheim for her PhD. And yeah, of course, thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, it's a very interesting talk, very uh, big uh, move towards the wide isolation window. You have a couple of questions. Let me read them first. Uh, in one, uh, one plot method where the samples directly injected from 384 plate, if so, which LC model was used here and how was it customized to line injection from 384 well directly? Mm -hmm. So actually two different ones. So when we started to work with this uh, for this publication, we had the U3000. U3, um, now we are using the Vanquish Neo. And actually you can there just place the 384 well plate into the auto sampler. And then um, the only thing you need to do is to adjust the, the needle height, at least for the U3000. In the Vanquish Neo, even that uh, works automatically because there is a, a bottom detection sensor so there is no special adjustment needed for that. So free for well plates are predefined in both um, HPC systems. Yeah. 
Uh, many have stopped using FAMES for single cell due to the uh, CV switching cost and similar. Interesting to see it here. How many CVs uh, are you running? Yeah. So we actually have seen um, similar things when switching these CVs, especially for the short gradients. It's actually a disadvantage then. So we're using only one CV, so there's no switching. Um, this CV is at minus 50. And still, that's an advantage over using no frames because the signal to noise is improved. Um, and yeah, that's the reason we're using it. Yeah. Uh, next one. Uh, did you try comparing the data or while using any label strategy as a TMT? We are, of course, also working with um, labeled workflows. So we hear uh, Claudia, who will also talk today, did a lot of work previously in our lab when she was a PhD student um, and introduced the Proteo chip. So that one is still in use in our lab. Um, yeah, for us, the ID numbers are at a similar level. Of course, you can boost them with a carrier channel. However, although I did not show it to you today, this is also possible, of course, with uh, label-free workflows. When you are measuring, let's say, 40 cells or more in a separate run, and then use that to match. So here in the, in the publication, you can see that, that we um, doubled our ID numbers for the DAA workflow. OK. Uh, next manual. Uh... Great talk, Manuel. Can you comment on how the data completeness in your DIA data changes if you search the file separately from one another with either Diane or Spectronav? Mm -hmm. So, well, my personal impression is it changes dramatically and it's then much closer to what DDA um, does. Um, so most of the effect in having very good data completeness comes from very good matching across replicates. So it would be, so I showed to you this um, five replicates before, and there we had roughly 76 or something percent of um, data completeness. And it would be a bit higher for DAA in our hands, but, but not much if we analyze it file by file. OK, uh, thank you. We still have time. Uh, I do have my own question. When you do the 384 plate injection directly from the plate, what's your typical injection volume uh, would be? On you? Mm -hmm. So typically we work with a trap and elude workflow, and there the injection volume is 3.5 microliters. Um, with this, we also ensure that in case that the injection is not working perfect, but maybe 100 nanoliters or something remain in the in the well. With, then we ensure that this is um, you know a relatively small amount. If the volume was only one microliter, of course, then 100 nanoliters is already 10% um, of our sample. That's one reason for this relatively high volume. The second is evaporation again. So we can place this plate covered, of course, into the outer sampler over the entire weekend and um, make the machine running a long sequence without suffering from a dry plate on Monday then. Whereas this would be the case if we would use only, let's say, one microliter. So that, that's why usually 3.5. For direct injection, however, we try to limit the volume to one microliter. OK. Uh, there is, I don't see any other questions. Then I could ask you one more before we switch to the another uh, uh, presenter. Uh, I think uh, I would just probably ask all the uh, our panelists today, what's in your uh, opinion currently the minimal size set you would like to acquire for the single cell proteomics to get some meaningful data uh, in, in any mm -hmm. biological study? What, what your number would be? I think my numbers would be very similar to what, what Vadim said. Um, I think it might be a couple of hundreds that are sufficient for most projects. However, it of course depends on the biological question. So if um, the subgroup of cells you are looking for is only, let's say, 1% of the entire population, and you analyze only 100 cells, then there would be only one um, special cell inside, right? So then you would need to go for thousands of cells. And I think, so from what I have heard also in other um, symposiums, conferences, webinars, and so on, this is also for most of the groups um, 
try to aim for to to have at least a thousand samples a day or something. Oh, no, not a day, a thousand samples for for a workflow for for a study. And I think with having now 100 samples a day or 200 samples a day, as, as showed before, Vadim, we are actually um, close enough to, to, to that, right? So that's um, a feasible thing to do, a thousand cells. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Manuel, for your presentation today. Uh, we're Thank moving to much. the next speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce you to the Ben Osborne, and uh, he is going to have a presentation today uh, with title Applying Single Cell Proteomics to Answer Question in Human Pharmacology. He is currently at John Hopkins University, you know, Department of Medicine. Ben, please. Great. Uh, I lost my slides. PowerPoint. Try this. Sure. It just blocked it. One side. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Cool. Is that the right one? Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, yeah. Thanks um, for that and uh, for inviting me. To this secret thing I didn't know about that you guys had. Um, all right. So, so quick talk overview. Um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, how I'm attempting to use single cell proteomics or apply it to understand um, some some uh, riddles in in human pharmacology, um, and and why we need to use it for some drugs and in some conditions. And then I'm going to show where we're uh, you know some some um, intro results and in, um, trying to uh, to scale it to the size of an average single cell seek study. And and so this is this is my. Um, you know, pitch all the time on, on why this pharmacology needs single cell. And, and you know, ultimately pharmacology deals with uh, the study of drugs and their, you know, actions on, on living systems and typically, you know, typically humans. And, and really what our, our, our uh, um, lab is focused on historically is, is it really understanding heterogeneity and drug response. And a lot of that's been by, you know, really digging into why different individuals respond to the same drug in different ways. And, um, you know, uh, as, as we start to dig in deeper, uh, we, we see more and more heterogeneity and honestly just gets more depressing as we continue to move down because, you know, some drugs, they work great. There's, uh, sometimes they have these great chemotherapeutics that will destroy a tumor, but they'll destroy human hepatito hepatocytes faster, right? So, uh, you know, so different organs are going to respond to the same drug in very different ways. Um, and again, as we move down, different tissue types within within a, within an organ uh, may respond very differently. And uh, Hannah and my group will, will have some stuff out later this year that'll, that'll show where she's really just kind of subsecting um, uh, different tiny little brain regions and, and specific cell types within brain regions and showing that, you know, how, how the same drug it responds very, very differently across these. And, and really the most depressing part is that, that individual cells within a cell type population may respond to the exact same dose of the exact same drug in very different ways. And, and so the big argument here, and I'm going to take it from the, the, the single cell seek study that I use all the time, or this review from Shalik and Benson, where, you know, uh, where they're talking about why we need to use single cell seek um, um, over bulk cell uh, analysis for RNA-seq. Because if you, you know, really take a big biopsy and it's a blend of different cells and you homogenize those cells, right, you may be measuring, you know, there's kind of two situations here where you're either taking a look at the cells that are the most abundant in that population or the ones that have the highest protein content or in the worst case situation you're actually measuring a fictitious cell right you've got three populations of cells there you homogenize those um and you're thinking hey, okay well this this is the phenotype that i need to you know that i need to worry about that i need to dose to get rid of these cells and that cell that you just measured may not actually exist because you've met you've, you've homogenized these these populations and and then their argument would be that you know when you go to single cells analysis uh, that you can start to get a picture that there's multiple populations of cells there. And then you can start to do some, some stuff with precision um, and kind of targeting, right? And um, uh, Abigail um, recently wrapped up in our group, uh, you know, did a really nice review of all sorts of different single cell technologies and, and how we, you know, how those could be applied and where they would make sense. Now, um, so what we're trying to do is, is is take single cell proteomics and it's, you know, 
uh, in, in kind of its earliest state. There's been lots and lots of development since, but, um, you know, and, and I'm starting to get sold on some of these new approaches that everyone is, everyone else is using. But, you know, we kind of started with, uh, um, with, with, uh, with, with Bogdan, with your, with your paper and, and kind of went from there. Cause it's like, Hey, it, it takes a long time to develop a new pipeline. We kind of just take a pipeline, build that out, and then just apply it to as many models as, as we can. But, um, ultimately, because, you know, I've got to, uh, I've got to tell this, uh, all this work to, you know, um, clinical pharmacologists, you know, uh, I've, I've got a series of check marks that I need to go down. Right. And so a pharmacology tool would have to have QC and QA metrics up front, right? Like everyone in my department's, uh, you know, MDs and, and they just, they, they're not even going to look at the data unless, you know, we've got this QC, QA thing, at least something set up up front. We've got to get the standardization and things down, not only because, you know, the people operating this may be clinical pharmacologists, right? Or, and that's what they're studying. They're not mass spectrometrists. We need to really get this standardized down to, hey, here's a solid SOP. And once we get that, we kind of stick with it, right? And then we can start to apply it. And then we need to get to uh, your question, Bogdan, uh, what, what's a pharmacologically relevant number of cells? And so here, uh, I'm just going to punt that question and just say like, look, single cell seek is being applied to questions in human pharmacology right now, every single day. And if we take a look at what the average size of a single cell seek study is, considering we're getting about the same amount of coverage, you know, they're, they're you know, the average single cell seek study is getting around um, 800 transcripts per cell. We can get pretty close to that. And I think that we need to kind of push our studies to the size of the studies that they're doing. Um, and then of course, you know, if we can get it compatible, our, our data compatible with historic pipelines, that's great. And that's just not, not me just knocking the, the new next generation TOFs because, you know, they're not compatible with everything. It's just really that we, you know, we want to make sure that that works and then we can hopefully get the cost down. Right. And so, um, you know, I did two postdocs in, in cancer stuff before I went to, to industry and I worked very closely with uh, this um, this amazing group that's called the RAS Initiative in, in Frederick, uh, Maryland, and uh, most of them study KRAS, and, and they do that because KRAS is present in about twenty five percent of solid tumors. And uh, for years and years, they've been very mopey and depressed because everyone just you know for years has just been saying, oh, you know, undruggable and untargetable and all sorts of other negative things about this. But they kept working on this, and they keep you know for for years and years because KRAS is at the top of this very busy you know pipeline here of of these three pathways. But ultimately, you know, KRAS. Uh, <laughs> control survival, pr proliferation and cytokine production. And if, and if there's a, you know, if there's a top 10 list of, of things you don't want tumors in your body doing, well, it's, it's those three things, right? And mutant KRAS is always constantly in this active state. So it's saying survive, proliferate, produce cytokines. Let's go, let's go, let's go, right? And so um, if it hadn't been for COVID, um, I think that that uh, this Satorosib, which was originally AMG510 um, developed by Amgen, this intelligently developed uh, small molecule inhibitors um, would be the like, would have been the biggest story in all medicine. We were all distracted by this virus, right? But but um, you know, satorosib can can selectively, and it's just amazingly selective and and, and uh, incredibly specific at, at finding the KRAS pocket and then binding into the uh, the, the G12C mutation, which is the you know the spare cysteine that would. Uh, covalent would, would love to just grab on the GDP and stay active all the time, but, but this can now compete it, bind covalently to it, and then inhibit the uh, the active form. And so immediately, you know, while the world was falling apart, everyone got really, really excited about this. You know, the bright future of KRAS inhibitors and those kind of things. But, but, but almost immediately thereafter, you know, we we, we started just like every other cancer drug that that we've ever used, we we started to see um, multiple reports of. of uh, of both um, uh, models and human beings here in, in, in GMS um, um, developing resistance to these things. Right? But despite this, you know, while the FDA had a lot of things to do during COVID, this is such a big deal that they accelerated this through and improved it. And we're not talking, you know, nor, you know FDA isn't the fastest thing in the world. Like it generally takes years in pipelines for get drugs to get through. This is so good. We're, we're talking about a pipeline of months, right? This is how important these drugs are for people who have these really, really bad news mutations, right? And and so um, almost immediately we 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 see these you know all, all this stuff is just happening here in the last two years we see this fantastic work from um, uh, Jeff uh, Joseph uh, Mancius's group um, where uh, they did everything right where they did exactly what we would have done uh, you know that, that uh, the NCI does in the drug mechanism group where you you low dose cells for a long time you make them get resistant and then you you look at the um, 
the transcripts in the proteome and, and, and try to find what's different. You know, what, what proteomic effects, what were the phenotypic alterations that are causing these cells to become resistant drugs to that drug. And then they inhibit it. And what they did was, uh, they, they found multiple, um, uh, things that they could inhibit that would block the res the cells ability to become resistant to these. And one of them was so good, right. That, you know, again, we're, we're talking on time frame of months. They found this ship two, a ship two inhibitor plus uh, satorosib is already, you know, just a few months ago, um, that been fast tracked for patients. So, so, you know, super exciting stuff. Right. And so great, great news. Right. But, but, uh, almost in parallel, uh, group did uh, a single cell seek study again, you know, where people are using single cell seek for pharmacology, you know, every single day and, uh, you know, in a really, you know, big, beautiful study, um, um, they multiple experiments end up doing around 11,000 mutant cells, different cell lines, different experiments across the board. But, um, they ended up finding out, um, uh, yeah, and come up with this very depressing title where, the cells that were becoming uh, resistant were doing it in a rapid and, and non-uniform way. And so this is pretty busy, but, but ultimately what you see is that the cells were, you know, these cells, they, they want to live, right? And so here you are, you're inhibiting their pro-growth, their, their pro growth, pro-proliferation responses, and they're trying all sorts of different pathways to try to survive, and some of them work. And they, they end up finding that there's three um, main uh, ways that the cells were becoming resistant to or adapting to krsg 12 c inhibition, right? And this is where I think single cell seek really plays in, right? Because it can tell us that there are subpopulations, but it doesn't tell us what their phenotypes are. And you can oof, you can go to the mat with it with a single cell seek people, right? They're like, oh yeah, no, the transcripts are phenotypes, and of course they 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 are fucking are not, right? That like that's not a phenotype, that's a genome, right? So so um, but. I, I think that we can still use this as a tool, right? So, so just to summarize this first part here, um, you know, ultimately, you know, a population may, of cells may become resistant to the same drug in very different ways. And even extremely sub small populations, just a couple of cells may be very, very important because that may be recurrence. It might, it, you know, it probably doesn't take just one cell to, um, you know, to, to cause recurrence in somebody who's, you know, um, um, had their cancer, you know, effectively treated, but it doesn't take very many. Right. And so my interpretation here is that we, we may need high end more than we need high coverage. And, and really, I, I think that single cell seek may, may play a role in my, where I see how this, how my, my program is going to continue to develop. I think that we'll continue using single cell seek as a filter for when we should apply single cell proteomics, because it'd be great if single cell seek is, you know, like you just buy the software, you use $10 to sell. If that solves the question, maybe we don't need it. Right. Or if the single cell seek says, Hey, there's only one way that these cells, there's only one population of cells, then, then we don't need single cell proteomics. Right. So, so our current method, is a, is a direct adaptation on it, um, a scope MS or scope two, right? But but um, you know, trying to get the throughput up, and and really, we're using um, uh, time of flight instruments just because they're, you know, largely because they're faster. I really do like the Tim's toss and and the increased selectivity that allows, with, you know, due to the um, uh, the Tim's thing on the front end. But essentially, we're sorting control cells and treated cells, and then uh, I'll show you in a minute how we're mixing those, and, and we are doing uh, multiplexing here. Um, just, you know, um, uh, very soon we're going to hit that tipping point where we like the LFQ data more, um, especially with some of the stuff we're seeing here today, but essentially every plex, um, every TMT plex will have some control cells some treated cells. And the way we've got this set up is that the, that we, we alternate channels in every, you know, next injection, trying to eliminate batch effects or whatever, you know, uh, things across the board. And, uh, because this is a customary thing that you do in proteomics, uh, I'll show you the very best cells that I've ever ran, um, in, um, you know, Three years of doing that, uh, single cell full time, and and so in in most cancer cells, um, we can get um, in in the one thousand proteins um, per cell range um, using like thirty minute gradients. Um, right now, uh, yeah, so we're using the TMT Pro, um, and we're just skipping every other channel, right? That way, we've just got the the ones that are ten um, are exactly one Dalton apart. That gives us uh, you know seven cells per injection after you know our our, our carrier and our blanks and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, using an easy nano that gets us to 224 cells a day uh, as we're experimenting more with EvoCEP and, uh, the, uh, the LC methods that were recently published, uh, Sarah Parker's group, um, that pushes us uh, to nearly double that because we're just utilizing better LCs at that point. Right. 
And, and um, the data consistency uh, is pretty good. I mean, at the top, you can see here, um, this is some early data from uh, early 2020, um, where, you know, as a carrier channel and our uh, single cells, that's the top. The, the, the bottom is more interesting, where it's actually a single protein measured across maybe 400 cells, controlled and treated. Um, you know, and, and, and this, this is pretty consistent with the high abundance, uh, higher abundance proteins, you know, that we don't have to do a lot of normalization with those in most cases, um, that they, they're pretty consistent. As you start to get down to the lower, lower abundance proteins, they get a lot more, you know, a lot wackier, right? And again, like everyone else would just show that, you know, the proteins track to the theoretical copy numbers. And I mostly just show this to say like, you know, uh, if, if somebody wants to collaborate, their protein of interest is less than hundred thousand copies. And we've got to think a little harder about that. Um, and if it's transcription factor, like, uh, come back in 10 years, well, we can talk about it then. Um, uh, and, and in terms of uh, and in extreme drug treatment cases, um, we can do simple things like uh, you know use PCAs uh, to, to separate out things. And and in this case, this is a uh, this is satorosib treated. Uh, geez, I think this is a double uh, two copy mutant cell line. So this thing's been growing for seventy years with KRAS mutants saying grow 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 grow, and we dumped in a covalent inhibitor. Ultimately, this clusters so nicely for this small number of cells because it's it's, it's cell cycle mediated effects. Um, and then if we compare that to single cell seek, you know, the same, same dosage, same, same conditions, basically we, we get this really solid overlap at the pathway level. But again, this is a pretty extreme case. You know, we've, we've, we've shut off KRAS, which is the primary driver in the, in this cell line. And again, it's cell cycle stuff. Um, and there was a really nice, uh, I should have cited here, uh, um, um, uh, uh, paper recently that, that pulled out 119 proteins and in, involved in cell cycle. And I made some tools and actually I really, if you use protein discover, there's a, there's a little graphical thing that you can download from this GitHub that will flag the proteins that are cell cycle mediated. And, and so for QCQA, uh, actually took some tools that Connor Jenkins wrote during his master's and, and kind of distorted those to do something new. And uh, Dietary SCPQC takes a look at the spectra themselves, like right after we've acquired them, and it counts the reporter ions. Um, so here you can see uh, in run 775 and, and run 782 on this TIMSOF, the 128 and reporter ion is significantly lower than in the other run. So that's one of the, the outputs here. Um, and, you know, in general here, we, we can look at, uh, you know, a larger body of cells and see, you know, in general, um, uh, if we look at the number of spectra per run that have each, uh, you know, detectable reporter ion, we're getting here maybe in an eight to 10,000 um, spectra that, that have good high quality uh, reporter ions for each, each single cell. This helps us flag uh, cells that have failed and also allows us um, you know, if, if they look really bad, just toss that run, right? We lost, we lost 30 minutes there, but, but do you really want a TMT plex where only two single cells worked? Right. So, so that allows us to flag those kind of throw them out. So it's a, it's a nice intro QC QA pipeline. Right. And so again, I guess, uh, it, but a tool, yeah, we've got, we've got some QA, um, um, you know, we've, we've got some, um, metrics and protocols in, in, in line. Um, I, I like where our pipeline is right now. Um, we can process it with everything. And you know, the next question is, can we scale it to the, the size of a normal single cell seek study? And um, so because my cell in one is in um, the Johns Hopkins single cell um, transcriptomics core, I spend a lot of time over there and I get a good, I've been getting a good feeling for what, you know, the, you know, you see in nature and science and these big papers, like people do a million cells. Nobody really does that. People do the normal cell that go, uh, study that goes through for single cell seek is 2000 to 4,000 cells. And again, they're getting around 800 transcripts measured per cell. And that's, you know, and I think that's, um, you know, it looks big, right? Because you're getting a lot, you know, because over 8,000, you know, over several thousand cells, it looks like you've got thousands of, you know, you've got 3,000 transcript measured, but in general, we're about the same coverage. So, so here, um, end, end of the, um, yeah, end of 2022, um, a student was using some KRS G12D um, cancer cell lines for another project. Um, I was able to get some flask of those, treat those on MRTX1133 and um, prepared cells, proteomics, proteomics, and single cell proteomics. And I had this goal, like I had this in my head because I thought, you know, most, most of the studies I was seeing going through the core were around 4,000 single cells. And I do 4,000 single cells and, and do that by myself in 30 days. And, and it could, I came close. So I, I could, uh, the, had some technical issues with some of the lines and stuff, but it, but it seems completely feasible to do a study this size, um, this kind of thing. Again, I've got, uh, I've got the cell in one in here. I decided not to use it. Um, uh, you know, really, really like the thing. And as soon as we can, and 
uh, afford to have someone whose job is to operate the cell in one full time or part time, or, or then then we'll use that more. And so anyone that's looking at this product, I think it's a it, you know it's it's really nice system. Um, it's it's not something that you can do you know one hour a month or um, I, th I think you really need to have somebody specialized that does that. And as soon as I can justify that, then um, this will move from something that we don't use and we all hate to something that we'll use all the time. And it's and it's amazing. It's just that you know getting over that tech technical um, setup with people. So I, I did this the old fashioned way with a MoFlow analog sorter and, and someone with 40 years of experience operating uh, sorters and I had plates and plates and plates. And I pre printed a method um, earlier this year just, just so that, um, you know, one of the limitations of cello one currently is that you can't mix control and treated cells in the same plex, right? Um, though, uh, yeah, I, was, uh, I told that to Alexander Ivanov and he was like, oh, well, here's how you do it. But but obviously, you know, I haven't impl implemented that because he was absolutely right and I still feel dumb about it. But um, but right now we're doing it this way. And then and really, I like preprints because, you know, you, you can really put in the stuff that's super essential. Like, hey, when, when your optometrist talks you into getting progressive lenses because you're fucking old, then maybe, uh, yeah, maybe you'll get much, much better at doing single cell prep, right? And but but because we're doing these things in plates and we're using relatively high High, high volumes uh, for the prep. We can also use robots that are, we, we find a lot less in, intimidating and a lot um, easier to use. And, and this is something that, you know, we'll pr probably we'll get someone in and we'll start using this LM1 all the time instead. But but uh, this, this is a capability. We could go to the open trans pretty easily with this. Right. And so, so preliminary results, and I'll show you, this is what I'm really, really super excited about now. And I think, you know, we've had this really cool benchmark in single cell proteomics where People will, will do, um, will uh, analyze a bunch of HeLa single cells and a bunch of heck HeLa cell, uh, single cells and show like, hey, non-supervised analysis. I, I can see that these are very different, right? But then you think about it and they're like, well, the HeLa cells, you get twice the protein content of the other one or vice versa. And they have very different replication rates and, and they're from, um, they were derived from different things originally. So that's, while, while it's still a really cool metric and, and honestly one that's sometimes hard to hit as you're trying to develop on a new technology, um, uh, this is really cool because these are pancreatic cancer cells that were derived from, from different patients in the exact same way and they're often used interchangeably in the literature. They're about the same size um, uh, because they were derived from the same material initially. Um, and these cluster independently very well. And they did this throughout the entire study. Now, we'll say here that uh, one of these cell lines um, um, has um, uh, is, is uh, a requirement for insulin supplementation in the growth media. So this may be completely driven by just insulin receptor pathway, but but still the fact that these cell lines were so were so similar, they have the same mutagenic background. If I didn't mention that before, that's why they're used so interchangeably, because um, many of the major the major you know mutations that drive them are, are, are the same. So these are very different. So that's the good news. Now, the bad news is that um, in this study, and also <laughs> this is not the first study um, that we have done where where uh, we could not tell the difference between our control and drug treated cells um, in 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 single cells. and and in fact, I think at this point, by far the majority of, of drugs that we've we've treated, you know, we've either done one thing where we've uh, where the cell uh, the drug has been too um too deleterious or the drug has been too deleterious on the cells. And then, so all your, you, you have this very small population of living cells and they're very strange. Um, and the data is hard to interpret or, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not dosing them enough. And, and so there's some problems here that we have to, to really think about from the bulk proteomics level, the, these, I, I can see some differences in these cell lines. It's not, it's not the most extreme thing in the world, but the single cell level, they basically have overlapped the whole time. Um, and I'll zoom in on one of these, just uh, one of these experiments here. Um, and because you're supposed to be using, we're supposed to be using grown-up statistics like TSNE and UMAPs. And, and uh, um, so here's a PCA on the left and um, a TSNE um, from Perseus on the same data set on the right. And it still says, uh, these look basically the same, right? Now, um, I, I do want to back up to this figure again on the right um, to show that there there are there are four experiments here. Um, there's, there's a few more things here, but so... Um, you know, I think when you look at Bogdan's original paper, we're using uh, fact sorting to collect the cells for the carrier channel versus some of the newer stuff where um, where people will make a very nice bulk cell homogenate, measure it very nicely and use that as the carrier channel. And so there, there's two sets of experiments here, the ASPC1 with uh, facts um, 
collected um, carrier channel versus a pole, and those do look very, very different. And the major the major effects here are that when we use the bulk cell homogenate data uh, or bulk cell homogenate uh, um, for the carrier channels, we are definitely um, biasing things toward um, picking up cells that the drug was possibly very effective for, right? So we're picking up caspases and, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the trad death protein, these things that are like pro program cell death are being, are being picked up where when we fact sort the cells where we are, when we're, you know, we're artificially selecting for the live cells, right? So, so we are, we are imparting a bias here. I still don't know a good answer about whether, whether we should be doing it from the bulk, hom bulk cell homogenate or, or whether we should be doing it from, you know, fact sorting the way that, you know, we will have to do that on the, on the cell one essentially. Um, uh, because I think that that'll be, very dependent on the dosing conditions of the drugs and 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 this is why there's pharmacologists all around me that i can um ask you know these things that, that make the most sense biologically and, and from an interpretation standpoint but um yeah so, so some takeaways here um I, I i think you know the one of the best things i can say about 2022 is that you know that um that it's not going to be that hard to do single cell seeks projects that are this or uh, single cell proteomics projects the same size as what the typical single cell seek study is. You know, four thousand. Uh, say, say two years ago, my department chair asked me, "Hey, how how hard would it be to do ten thousand cells?" And I said, "Well, you know, I need six months." Now I feel like oh, 10, yeah, I could do that in, in in a month or two, right? So we can, we can do studies that size pretty easily. Um, and, and for some drugs, we can, we can learn a lot from it and, and it can be very complimentary. It gives us extra information that single cell seek does not. Um, but for drugs that, that, that either impart a lot of cell death or for things that impart relatively small changes, especially in lower abundance proteins, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, maybe, 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 um, label free and DIA are the way to go. And, and as the throughput gets closer, um, you know, may very well shift to that, but, um, yeah, so quick acknowledgements, uh, my, de uh, department chair, um, is now the, um, currently the chief scientist, uh, Namanje for supporting all this stuff. Uh, Connor, uh, you know, developed a lot of software we're using. Um, Colton Hannah and I met are the current um, people in the lab. Colton's, uh, yeah, if, if you see his uh, um, CV, um, you should hire him. He's really, really good. Uh, and Eric and Abigail, um, yeah, uh, both recently moved on. But um, yeah, here's the takeaways. So um, I think I was okay on time. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, very interesting talk. There is a lot of uh, things to, uh, I like myself personally, because we're doing a lot of drug treatments. We're looking for actually heterogeneity, as you, as you uh, told me. And uh, uh, I will uh, probably uh, read the QA. So if I don't see anything in QA, please uh, uh, put your questions into the QA that I could read them uh, in, in the meantime. I could ask or just update uh, uh, yourself that, you know, we do have an uh, interesting uh, observation here as well. When we do any preparation for the curate channel, you know, the way we, we do uh, is the uh, screen technology that we are looking for something that we want to do. Then basically we figure out that if you put more treated cells towards the untreated cells, you start getting those uh, proteome changes that actually are related to the particular drug. And it's interesting if you will see the effect of this when you just treat the same cell with two different drugs, and then you meet, mixed up in, into the Kira channel wrong drug, then you start to see actually effect of that. And just, you can play with it too. And of course, you know, uh, I love your uh, comparison to the single cell uh, sequencing. Uh, there is a lot of people who just ask me why we should actually even do proteomics compared to single cell sequence and then how deep they are. Uh, I'm glad to see and hear that they are not deep as I try to explain to my biologists too. They operate with the large numbers, uh, but not really much deeper than we are currently now. And I do believe that soon uh, there will be a true choice between proteomics and, and, and then uh, RNA sequencing to make the choices, because as you clearly showed in the presentation, yes, you do have a lot of changes upon the uh, RNA sequencing because it's much cheaper and faster to do. But the uh, disadvantages, in my opinion, that uh, you do not have a protein targets. And for any drugs, you need the targets. That's what we try to work hard to make some targets for the biologists to overcome those uh, uh, drug response heterogeneity. 
Uh, I don't see any other questions at I, this point. I can point. ask a question, Bogdan, since I, yeah, I please can, do. I, uh, yeah. panelists apparently can't access the Q&A box. Absolutely, so yeah. <laughs> Um, Sarah, ben, uh, please ask. <laughs> great work, Ben. Thank you so much for sharing today. Um, I guess my question was coming back to you know why why you're not seeing the the drug effect as strongly at the single cell level. How much do you think depth is part of it versus maybe PTMs? And I know you've shown a little bit of work where you've started to explore single cell PTMs. And have have you looked at that? Uh, so so the I would love to be able to say that that uh, what I was um, because. Really, what I'm looking for with these drugs is uh, uh, central MAP kinase changes, and at the proteome level, um, when, when just a you know DIA bulk proteomics, I'm seeing a lot. You know, I, I could clearly see ERK downregulated, and you know, and most people don't care about ERK as much as phospho work, but you know, I, and I wish I could say I, I could see that there, um, but ultimately, I think that you know, as we're uh, there's there's so much variability here that. Um, when I'm seeing something in the, the, the four different cell lines, I'm seeing, okay, uh, like a two to five fold down regulation of ERK. I think that my cells, the variability, my technical variability is bigger than that. And so I, you know, you would like to go through and pick out like a, the good cells or the, those do look like the ERKs down regularly. But I think that, I, I think that's more of a technical variability problem for, for, for this study in particular. And then, you know, I, I often don't really care about proteins that are differentially regulated less than fivefold because you know you can't validate those by Western bloods, right? <laughs> so um, I think that this is a relatively subtle effect because this drug doesn't bind covalently. It's kind of competing for GTP, and that that's my that's my thought here. And that there's probably the technical variability is the biggest problem. Okay. Oh, you kind of surprised me, Ben. Never thought that you were a believer in the Western blots, but you know, nice to know about that part. <laughs> uh, uh, it's quite unusual for the mass spectrometers to believe in Western blots, but I do understand <laughs> you're in a tough situation in the pharmacology department. Um, okay, that's the time for the next presenter. Thank you, Ben, for your for your uh, talk, uh, and we're moving to our next presenter, uh, uh, Claudia. Uh, Claudia is presenting the Broad Institute here in Cambridge, uh, uh, nearby, across the river from, from me. And the uh, uh, title of her talk is a title on producible single cell protein profiles define the cell subpopulation at the high throughput. And then, uh, please, uh, it's your time, Claudia. Thank you, Bogdan, for the introduction. And I hope you can see my slides and my pointer. Um, so yeah, this is my very brief um, title of my talk. Um, I'm a postdoc in Stephen Curry lab, and I'll be talking today um, a lot about um, our proteotype workflow, the ideas behind it, and actually what our newest advantages and um, uh, endeavors are um, to actually focus on the application of our proteotype. So let's jump right into it. Um, I will be talking today um, a lot about multiple different aspects of how we want to most efficiently process single cells um, or actually also very small subpopulations uniformly, because I think that uh, from the last different talks that we heard, the uniformity of the different uh, preparations and then also bringing it all the way um, to the acquisition and the data analysis is something that most people still struggle with. And we want to, to also start already with the sample preparation to make it more reproducible and actually also quicker. So I'll be focusing um, a lot on the proteotype-based workflows, uh, which work best in our hands. Um, as Ben was saying, um, the selling one actually uh, requires a lot of um, a lot of love and dedication. Um, and I've been um, working with the instrument for quite a long time. So for us, definitely the proteotype workflows within the selling one entirely works the best. Um, the proteotype comes in multiple different flavors right now. Um, we have um, the multiple uh, multiplexed um, um, proteotype that you can see on the that you can see down here. Um, that also Manuel was uh, briefly talking about, and then also we have our label-free uh, proteotype that is entirely um, integrated into the cell one workflow. 
Um, and to sell on one actually allows you to operate your entire workflow um, in a temperature and humidity controlled environment, which we see, uh, which we have identified to be quite crucial for um, elevating reproducibility and having a uniform workflow. So basically what we do is we put everything that we have into the cell in one and then um, go from there. So um, already a couple of years ago um, in my previous lab with Carl Mechler, um, we, we started to work on the label free chip. And um, all of the uh, all of the proteotrip workflows basically start um, with the image-based cell isolation that uses bright field and fluorescence microscopy. Um, so you insert your cell uh, solution into the cell in one, you take it up, and then you can dispense um, you can dispense them into into your chips. Um, we have these chips designed um, out of Teflon to actually minimize adsorptive peptide losses. And those are um, designed in, in very small wells that you can see on the bottom right side. Um, so these very low, um, low nanoliter um, uh, vessels actually allow us to keep the variance um, between the samples as low as possible. And we're also aiming to reduce adsorptive peptide losses using these very low, um, low volume samples. Um, and for this, also, since we have been starting um, to work with Selenium, um, they have come up with a variety of uh, different tailored workflows. Um, as I was saying, they all start with their uh, image-based um, cell isolation. And what um, I really like about um, the, the image-based um, um, cell isolation is that whenever you're selecting a cell of choice, you can dispense it in your, uh, in your well of choice and that uh, picture is actually stored. So retrospectively, you can go back um, and look at that picture of that specific cell for quality reassurance. So I had a couple of different um, projects where I actually noticed um, a lot of uh, variability in between the cells. And I can actually go back and really make sure that only one cell was isolated or how that cell morphologically possibly differs from uh, any other cell that I've been isolating within that project. Now, um, to a bit more um, technical details about the cell in one per se, um, it operates with a glass capillary that also Manuel was already showing, and it uses PSO acoustic technology to actually dispense picoliter droplets of pretty much any buffer at very high speed. Um, and in our workflow, um, basically all of the workflows that I'm using, uh, we mostly use a combination of an MS compatible detergent for um, lysis and denaturation. Um, and a uh, protease for enzymatic digestion. Uh, we perform this simultaneously, um, as I was saying, in the temperature and humidity controlled environment of the cell in one to really have these 100 to 200 nanoliters of total volume as stable as possible. Um, now, one um, of the biggest advantages that was um, that we identified very early on in our uh, process to develop workflows for single cell proteomics was the desire to somewhat interface our vessels with uh, with our LC. Um, I think um, that basically approaches uh, one of the biggest errors. Um, uh, so errors and also um, uh, possible causes of um, adsorptive losses of, of peptides that are um, um, that are just basically sticking forever to all of your auto sample arrives. And um, this is possible uh, for both the multiplex and the label free chip um, and uh, which I'm going to focus on today. Um, and I consider this very critical because we're not just dealing here with very low sample volumes actually, which are hard to pipette in general, but additionally, um, I'm gonna present to you a quite large sample cohort. So you might be able to pipette two or lower than two microliters very accurately 10 times. But even if you're very frequently in the lab as me, if you're at sample 58, your error bars are probably gonna increase. Um, so I have really noticed that overcoming this um, manual pipetting in any kind of step throughout the workflow reduces the variability that I'm introducing very on um, in the workflow. So to put this really into numbers is when we prepare our single cells um, in one of those proteochips, 
and directly transfer it to the auto sampler from chromatographic separation versus me pipetting the same exact sample preparation out of the chip into um, the vessel for injection, we actually increase by 43% in protein identifications without any kind of manual sample handling. And this is, as I was saying, exactly the same uh, sample preparation, um, just overcoming that one step of pipe padding. Um, and I feel like um, this it really nicely illustrates why we have this urge and why we have this need actually to really make this as streamlined as possible. Now, um, the next highly important step for us, um, as we have heard already from uh, pretty much all of the previous speakers, um, is that we wanted to optimize um, and have the most efficient and high throughput chromatographic separation. And for this, um, I was extremely happy that um, Selenium and Evosep actually joined forces uh, to design a chip um, that basically directly interfaces with the Evotips. Um, which in that case represents our injection vessel. So we basically have a 96 well style for, um, label free proteo chip where we prepare all of our samples in. And this proteo chip um, interfaces directly with the AVO tips. And use, just using standard uh, benchtop centrifugation, we can basically transfer our single cell peptides onto these trap, uh, disposable trap columns and um, start our uh, chromatographic separation straight away um, that is even on top of that, um, uh, providing an inline cleanup um, using the Evosep workflow. And this automated transfer, which is, um, which is very easy to actually do in the lab, um, additionally boosts our identifications by 46%. And now we're ending up with um, our nicely optimized proteo chip workflow um, that interfaces with the AVO tips. We're using a nanoflow separation of 40 samples per day on the AVO sub with the Aurora columns. And um, if, when those are in front of my beloved Timstuff SCP, uh, we reproducibly identify 3000 proteins um, using DIA passive uh, from a single hex cell. So now this is great. But additionally, I always want to look at um, our data reproducibility and actually how much we can, um, um, how much accumulative missingness we have throughout our entire sample cohort. And for this, I always like to focus on the peptides that have been uh, quantified um, in, in high, um, that have been quantified in, in most of those runs. And what we can see on the x-axis is actually the individual single cell injections. And on the y-axis, I'm displaying the percent of missing peptides. So the missingness, which in each run is around five to 10%, which is somewhat expected when we're dealing um, with this, uh, with this low input amounts. But cumulatively, cumulatively across all of these different analytical runs, we actually do not exceed uh, missingness uh, by more than 15%. So even though we have been doubling the identifications um, using the 40 SPD method versus our 30 minute effective gradients on the uh, nano elute, uh, we actually do not see an increase um, in, in missing us. And that also is a good indicator for me that our uh, workflow is extremely reproducible. Um, um, and we can actually um, dig into biology. So we wanted, to start looking into actually what we can do and how we can apply our workflow to any kind of biological question. So um, for this, one of the most important steps for me was to reduce the processing time as much as possible, because we obviously want to process as many cells um, from different um, conditions, which actually goes nicely in line with whatever um, Bogdan was asking. Um, so I think that you will have to um, process and actually compare um, a couple of different um, cells. That is definitely um, that is definitely hypothesis dependent. But the more conditions you have, the more cells you'll need to process, and the more um, um, and and. In our project, at least from, from what we have seen so far, it's usually hundreds of cells that you're processing per day, which preferably should be processed uh, within as little um, delay as possible to obviously keep technical variation to a minimum. 
In our, in our current setup, um, um, that allows us to simultaneously process two 96-volt chips within the cell one within around a workflow time of three hours. So when I aim um, to estimate uh, the reproducibility of my workflows, as I was showing previously, I prefer always to look at data completeness, um, especially when I'm looking at different uh, treatment conditions. And in this example that I'm going to show you today, actually, um, the combination of our Nanoflow 40 SPD method um, with the Timstoff SCP um, performing DIA passive analysis results in around 90% um, data completeness across our entire sample cohort. So now I'm going to show you um, a relatively short treatment of HEC293 T cells with a microgram of LPS. And over the DS, uh, DMSO control, we can actually barely see any differences in the proteome changes. However, when we really focus on what has been at least um, uh, changing slightly, and then we perform a pathway analysis on these um, somewhat regulated proteins, we identify um, metabolic and inflammatory pathways as we would have expected to see in those cells. Now, what I find very interesting personally is that with increasing the concentration, which we can see on the middle graph here, uh, we can see a lot more going on in those cells. Um, and specifically when we focus now on the cell, on the pathways that we are um, identifying in the, in the first concentration, we actually see quite a boost and um, quite a regulation from the DMSO control to the low level to the higher level, which is il illustrated on the left-hand side where we can see that um, in the highest concentration, we can see the most changes um, of those pathways that we're actually expecting to see. So one might start to argue, well, you're just showing us exactly what you were expecting to see. But as Ben was already elaborating, um, and I personally have been working a lot with both proteome profiling and actually single cells, um, I can tell you that seeing that result was basically getting a new instrument and Christmas on one day. So we've been really, really excited to actually see um, those uh, pathways being altered um, in single cells, uh, no fancy uh, data, um, data perturbation, no fancy um, um, batch correction, um, other than whatever we're really trying, we're, we really are obligated to use basically. Um, um, and from this, um, I was very, very convinced that we can actually move forward and uh, try something that is even, um, even more exciting. Because I always ask myself, why should I stop if everything starts to work smoothly? That would not be a proper postdoc. So we wanted to monitor not just the alterations in pathways, but also actually look at specific drug targets in single cells. And um, our aim is on the long run to possibly profile differences in drug uptake or actually just really distinct treatment uh, responses. And I started this process by looking at the abundance of our target on the RNA level. And even though we all know that proteins in RNA um, doesn't always correlate, this is why we're all here, I wanted to get a feeling of what I'm actually getting myself into here. So uh, we can see that our target is somewhat medium to high abundant in that cell, um, cell type on the RNA level. However, when I start to overlap the, um, um, the RNA expression profile with the proteins that I've been identifying and quantifying from the same exact cell type, just using our um, 40 SPD method and a single cell workflow, we again actually are um, quite nicely um, seeing the fact that the RNA abundance does not necessarily tell us anything about um, our protein abundance, even when we're looking at the exact same cell type. So based on this, I started to look into the single cell proteomics data that we actually do have from exactly this cell type. And even on the protein level, I found that our target that I'm anticipating to profile um, is somewhat medium uh, in the uh, medium to higher in the abundance range. So um, that made me more confident that I'll be able to see it not only um, in a couple of cells, but to see it uh, hopefully in the majority of injections. 
and actually do catch abundance changes um, up on chemical perturbation. So um, even though I, um, I was quite happy to see that um, this target is quite high in abundance, and I could actually identify and quantify it in most of our um, preliminary um, trial experiments, um, the study that we're anticipating to perform uh, profiling this drug target um, actually in, requires a lot more, a lot higher throughput than we can currently provide with the 40 SPD method. So I overlaid our 40 SPD quantification um, with some very, very preliminary data that I got um, using the 80 SPD method. And what I'm very, very glad to see is that even in um, this much, much higher throughput um, throughput workflow, um, using a, also a shorter column, I can still quantify um, my, uh, my anticipated drug target in most of our single cell injections. We can see that here um, uh, we, we have a very similar abundance distribution, which also made me quite confident that actually what we see is, um, is true. And we're starting now to really look into more um, into more detail of um, how we can um, extend the dynamic range and which allows us to eventually start to actually screen treated single cells um, in a higher throughput, um, not as high throughput as Vadim was presenting, but still higher throughput than we have ever seen before um, in our lab. So that already, um, brings me to the summary of today. Um, and I hope I was able to demonstrate that our proteotype based workflow actually minimizes uh, peptide losses, uh, which continues to be one of the main problem, in my opinion, in our single cell endeavor. And uh, we have been improving our analysis depth in longer and shorter gradients um, using a combination of very great equipment and support from multiple different uh, vendors and um, I was um, I'm very fortunate to be able to increase the throughput to a level where I feel like screening is somewhat getting possible and um, to be uh, to be more uh, to be going into a bit more detail um, the um, elimination of manual sample transfer um, actually really nicely illustrates um, the the advantages that you get by streamlining your workflow. And additionally, when we um, when we combine um, our our workflow, um, our um, Avocep workflow with uh, with our high highly sensitive uh, DL passive acquisition on the Timstuff SCP, we can really nicely quantify and identify reproducibly three thousand proteins uh, per single cell, um, spanning a wide range of more than four orders of magnitude. And um, most importantly, our current depth actually allows us to not only characterize uh, biologically relevant pathways, but even uh, monitor drug targets uh, within single cells. And I'm actually really, really excited to see what we can get out of this um, in the near future. Um, and before I will jump to the most important slide of today, I want to actually quickly say that I'm very happy to see how many different approaches um, to the single cell um, sample preparation and acquisition and analysis uh, we have been hearing today. And that I'm convincing myself more and more each day that we're actually towards um, reaching the analytical depth and level of reproducibility um, that will allow to answer biological questions um, in the very near future. Um, and that will that already brings me to my acknowledgments where I would like to first and foremost, of course, thank Stephen Namrata for providing me with my playground here at the Broad um, and giving me the opportunity to work together with such smart people. Um, and also what we've seen um, today in my presentation, my longstanding and terrific collaboration with Selenian, where I really want to highlight David, Angeline, and Diem. Uh, for their continuous support. Um, additionally, I also want to highlight uh, Dota and Nikolai from Avocep, uh, Jared from Iron Optics, and basically the entire Brooker universe, for, and, but specifically Sebastian, Jonathan, Diego, and Matt for always um, helping me and being there uh, whenever my instrument breaks. Um, and this um, brings me to answering all kinds of questions that you might have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Claudia. It was a great talk. Uh, glad to see your uh, kind of enthusiasm and then that you become a true believer. 
<laughs> and try to move more people from RNA seq to, to the proteins. Uh, if there is anybody in the audience, please type in the QA and then a panelist. If you have a question, you can just ask them directly if you have those. And uh, uh, I, I, I have one, uh, Claudia, for you. When you do injections, usually what the volumes uh, are you injecting on the LC after the chip prep? What, what those volumes are? And uh, are you have any workload with the trapping column? All of those go straight to the uh, Aurora type of columns. Yeah, so um, volume wise, we're usually in the range of two to three microliters. Um, I've tried to go lower um, on, on the injection volumes really to keep the sample as concentrated as possible, but I'm really struggling with the, with the variability of uh, injection volumes there. So regardless of what LC I'm using, um, I'm trying to, to get my hands on, um, or I'm trying to be as more confident with using the Vanquish Neo to inject and be um, running into the risk of destroying a needle. Uh, we'll see um, how that will go. Uh, but usually it's in the range of like two to three microliters. Um, and the second question was with the trap column. So um, the only time I'm actually using trap columns is for the for the Evosep, where it's sort of like the disposable trap columns. But when I go on regular LCs, I do mostly direct injections, even for the Aurora columns. Okay, uh, two questions from the audience. The first one, thanks for the very uh, nice presentation. Did you try only Evosep or also uh, the standard LC workflow? You kind of already answered it, but the standard LC flow, I assume it's just the... Uh, palm that you used, uh, uh, but in just to add to this question, which one do you prefer to which way of uh, label on label or anything like that? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important aspect actually. So um, I really like the Avocet workflow because it's so seamless and it's so quick to actually transfer your samples. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, you can you can in, insert your the other proteo chips um, or any kind of well played into pretty much any LC. Um, I do prefer um, the Evocep though because it somewhat protects my column. And when we think about um, the injection reproducibility, I think um, that risking the life of a column by performing so many injections back to back um, is quite uh, is quite stressful. So um, I I I do prefer the Evocep in that regard that I'm protecting my column. Um, but I can, um, and I, as I was showing, the, the ID is definitely increased with the 40 samples per day as compared to a standard 30 minute um, um, LC injection, even though I, I'm still trying to go both, both ways, definitely, because I, I, I like to play around with the gradients as well. Okay, uh, and the next talk, the next question is about exactly that. Nice talk. How you've been you experienced with Proteo Cheap labeled workflow? Yeah, so I mean, um, we the 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 whole endeavor actually started uh, during my PhD in Carl's lab, basically with the labeled chip. So um, I I have a um, I had the uh, great pleasure to work together with David and Anjali to basically make that workflow as reproducible as possible. Um, and um, we we used the uh, multiplex uh, chip for more than three years, basically almost on a daily basis. Um, I will move most mostly to the uh, label free workflows now because I work on the broker systems. Um, but we definitely have the the TMT workflow still in place, and I think that is not so much a question of label free or multiplex workflow, but rather what your application actually asks for. And I feel like both have their own stance. Um, they're not um, either or, in my opinion. Uh, okay, the last question probably uh, due to time. In great talk, Claudia, can you estimate what amount of protein in picograms? You get uh, with your cell uh, cell one single preps uh, from the single hack cells, and based on comparison with the serial dilution or bulk digest, and then addition to that, or in comparison, HeLa to say K five sixty two. Yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. Um, I feel like estimation of of peptide uh, content is always very challenging. 
Uh, when we compare it to a bulk dilution, we're definitely somewhat in the range of 150 picograms per cell um, in our hex cells, which is somewhat um, also what um, is is reported in literature. Um, so we we definitely have higher identifications when we perform bulk dilutions, which is somewhat expected. I mean, they're much cleaner and much nicer prepared than our single cells. Um, but um, when we look at the overall tick, we probably um, end up with a 150 picogram. Um, and um, in relation to HeLa cells, um, hexes are definitely much smaller. So we do also have lower protein or peptide yield compared to those. K562, I have not processed myself in the cell in one, so I cannot um, answer that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your talk. It's great talk. And uh, we're moving to the uh, next speaker, the last speaker in, in our webinar today, uh, Sarah Porker. Uh, she's from Cedar Sinai Medical Center. And her talk today, uh, the title, Single Cell Proteomics Analysis of Complex Tissue Case Study in, in Our Talk. Uh, please, Sarah, your turn. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's, it's really exciting to hear what uh, everybody else has to say in this webinar and really neat to be here with the HUPO Single Cell Initiative. Thank you for the invitation, Bodhi. Um, All right, so uh, I'll be talking today about how we've been working to develop our single cell platform at Cedar sinai to apply towards um, really highly heterogeneous complex tissues. Um, I study the aorta, so I'll be talking about that as a case study. Um, let me make sure I can advance here. There we go. So I'm gonna start with just a bit of biological background so that as I show the single cell findings, there's some context to what we're, what we're seeing. Um, so the aorta, while it's a fairly simple physiological organ, it moves blood from one place to another. Um, it's actually quite complex cellularly. Um, it has many layers of cells, starting with the intimal layer uh, populated by endothelial cells, has lots of matrix, and then um, a medial layer with many smooth muscle cells, an adventitial layer that's uh, really quite heterogeneous, has fibroblasts, adipocytes, nervous cells, and many different types of immune cells present. And um, what we're learning uh, from single cell RNA-seq studies is that the composition, uh, the cellular composition of the aorta, both in terms of the types of cells present, um, as well as some of the internal molecular profiles of the cells differ pretty substantially um, as uh, pathology sets in, in, in pathologi pathological situations. So here's a, a really straightforward example um, using one of the most common models of, of um, heart disease, which is high fat diet induced atherosclerosis. So if you simply take a mouse and put them on what we call a Western diet, I want it very, very rich in lipids. Um, and then look at the single cell uh, RNA-seq data from the aorta, we see uh, pretty big changes in the types of cells that we see present in, in these mouse aortas. We see reduction in some immune cell populations, increases in others. Um, but what's also quite striking is that in the same study, we see big differences in the internal molecular profile of, of, of sort of these big classical cell types. So endothelial cell types, smooth muscle cell types, and macrophage cell types all segregate into multiple different subphenotypes. And the proportion of those subphenotypes uh, changes uh, as, as the high fat diet uh, produces the pathology. So uh, this is really intriguing for me as a vascular science researcher, um, but as we all know, and the reason we're here, uh, protein does not directly equate to, RNA does not directly equate to protein. Um, in fact, even at the level of one individual cell, I think there's some pretty great bioarchive papers now released to show that um, the level of RNA does not correlate very highly with the level of protein, even one cell at a time. So um, from our end, we really wanted to look at the proteomic heterogeneity of the aorta. Um, I've chosen to study the model that's really intrinsic to our lab, which is uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms. These are can be caused by both um, high fat diet and atherosclerosis and inflammation. But more frequently, these uh, aneurysms are actually caused by discrete genetic mutations. So they're hereditary and they're passed down through families. Um, aneurysms are so dangerous because they highly predispose the vessel to dissections and ruptures, which can be quite deadly. 
Um, so we've been developing a single cell proteomic platform to study um, mouse in the, in the mouse, uh, the aortic proteome. Um, we're looking at normal mice, and then we work with a mutant mouse model that uh, develops aortic aneurysms due to a single point mutation in a gene called fibrillin-1. So this mouse is a model of Marfan syndrome, a hereditary syndrome um, where, where an aortic aneurysm is quite prevalent. Um, so the platform that we've developed is a uh, standard collagenase and elastase dissociation of the organ to uh, an infiltration into single cell suspension. And then we also use everyone's favorite cell sorting and sample prep platform, the cell in one. Um, and we're using essentially a one pot uh, sample prep platform, a lot like some of the other presenters have, have mentioned today, uh, where we dispense the cells into a 384 well plate, and then all processing is done directly in the plate. Um, we use triptych digestion without any um, DTT or IAA reduction in alkylation. And then after digestion, these uh, single cell peptides are dried down, usually just through simple evaporation because we're working with such low volumes. Um, and then we do direct auto sampler based resuspension um, in about 20 microliters actually. So we use high volume um, resuspension to try to capture all the proteins there and then transfer them directly into um, a U3000 LC system that we've developed. Um, Simon Kramer in our group actually has spent a ton of time developing um, a dual trap nano flow system that allows us to load one trap and, and, and elute the samples and be acquiring data while the other sample is loaded or the other trap is cleaned and, and prepped for the next injection. Um, his methodology has enabled us to get um, about 11 and a half minutes of active data acquisition in 15 total minutes of mass spec LC time. So we're getting 15 total minutes of, of runtime per cell um, with about 77% um, instrument usage time. So if you want to read, if you want to learn more about this setup, I encourage you to look into a bio, our bioarchive paper, which will very soon hopefully be um, accepted for publication. Um, but this is, the, this is the method that we've been using to look at these really diverse um, heterogeneous proteomes. We're using a label-free approach here as well, and, and maybe this can be a point of discussion later, um, but uh, looking at the, you know, the landscape of methods to use um, and thinking about a barcoding-based strategy where the um, benefit to sensitivity really comes from aggregated observations within the multiplex, of the same peptide, um, we were concerned that with really heterogeneous samples where proteomes could be extremely different between say a fibroblast and a, an epithelial cell or an immune cell, um, we were concerned that the that, that barcoding based strategy, we wouldn't get that necessary amplification and that would really hinder our um, ability to, to, to quantify these heterogeneous proteomes. So um, then the other thing that we grappled with early on was whether to use DDA acquisition versus DIA acquisition. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into why this wasn't a simple question to answer. So we, you know, at the time that we were setting up our method, this paper came out um, uh, really showing a, a strong improvement in overall uh, protein identification numbers and consistency of quantification for protein uh, identifications. Um, using DIA-based uh, acquisition. So we chose to stick with DIA for, for this study. Um, and we started acquiring uh, data from our sorted plate of 384 aortic cells. And, you know, hot off the press, I started throwing them into Diane um, using uh, library-free searching against a mouse FASTA in silico digested proteome and learned pretty quickly <clears throat> that this might be a, a very challenging strategy. So right now, um, Diane uh, performs pretty slowly. Uh, it's a, it, took, it was taking us about 100 to 250 minutes per cell to search using library free Diane on our DIA passive data. So um, we then used a sort of a, a test library of a, of, a, uh, of a mouse publicly available macrophage database and found that we could get data within about a minute if we use a library. So we paused acquisition, um, backed up, and uh, decided to produce a, a sample-specific library using DDA acquisition on, on the TIMS talk. And um, we were concerned here because you know, we weren't going to sample the entire plate just in DDA. We wanted to simply create a representative library 
and then apply that library to subsequent DIA acquisitions. And um, you know, our, our concern was how do we make sure we're sampling a good diverse set of this heterogeneous population to make sure our library is adequately representative. So um, in, in an attempt to address that, we uh, used cell diameter based selection for our DDA acquisition and inclusion in these, this initial DDA library. Um, so we set cells between the diameters of 10 and, and, and 20 and tried to get uh, a number of acquisitions from each of these different diameters. And this is made possible because the cell in one prints out cell diameters of each well um, as, you, as you do your sort and dispensing. So from this first search, we searched it using frag pipe and um, we identified 547 proteins in the library from 2,800 or so peptides. And using some known markers of our, of our key cell types, we saw good representation of endothelial, fibroblast, macrophage, and smooth muscle cell types. Um, it was pretty clear that as might be expected, the most abundant cell type is smooth muscle cells. And that's pretty well known about aortic composition. So we have a, a high representation of smooth muscle cells and much lower representation of some of these other, but um, uh, less abundant, but, but likely very interesting cell types. So we wanted to try to bolster this library a bit using um, uh, sort of an integrated strategy. Um, so what we did was from that DDA-based search of our remainder of our plate acquired in DIA, we found the top 10 best performing cells. So the cells that had the highest number of proteins identified against the DDA library. And we selected those cells to be uh, subjected to Diane library free searching. And we, set, we segregated them by um, expression profile of known markers. So we searched the top 10 um, highest yield fibroblasts, macrophage types, smooth muscle, endothelial cell, and then no label could be detected type cells. Interestingly, the fibroblasts and the macrophages just for some reason did not search well at all in the Diane label-free label search, and um, we, we didn't really get any data um, from them. However, we did get very nice uh, library-free Diane spectral libraries made for the smooth muscle, the endothelial, and then the other the, the currently unknown cell types. Um, so we, that we, we built these together and merged them in with our existing DDA library, only adding the unique peptides seen in any of these libraries concatenated onto the DDA library. We also, um, I went out and found a Tim's Top publicly available um, macrophage data set and took the control cell lines from there, searched them in, in FragPipe and made an easy P PQP macrophage library that we also merged in to the now growing um, final merge library. So that would provide a little bit better representation of our macrophage subtype. So altogether, um, this library actually contained the results from five different search sets. So each of those search sets was filtered to 1% FDR, but our actual final library, because of the way we merged it, it was probably more like a 5% FDR for um, confidence in the hits. Um, so if we look at then the, 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 these different libraries all searched across the 200 and some DIA files that we had generated from, from individual cells. Um, we see pretty good complementarity uh, across the different libraries. Or sorry, this isn't this isn't the search result. This is the composition of the libraries themselves. So um, you know each of these libraries are providing unique peptides, um, but also a core set of common peptides between the different libraries. Um, same with proteins. We see a unique contribution of proteins, and then a fair amount of sharing as well. Um, then when we search these libraries. Uh, against our, our, our core set of, of DIA files, one of the questions I had was, you know, how, how confident can we be that the, that the you know, peptides brought in from each of these different libraries are, are really the same peptides and there isn't some false discovery rate or error. So this is really a, a sanity check that we did, but we, of these 500 peptides that were all shared um, across the different libraries, we just looked to see whether a peptide, you know, that came from the, the search of the DDA file library um, matched up in retention time to a pep the same peptide that was found in the macrophage, the search of the macrophage library. Um, and indeed we saw near perfect correlation between the retention times of the peptides um, that were defined by a different library. So retention time alignment between the libraries was good. 
and um, some semblance of confidence came from that, that analysis as well, that the library merging, even though we were sacrificing a little bit of the FDR filter, um, it's, it still generated um, believable results. So finally, we applied this to our, um, oh, sorry, one last, uh, one last comment on the library composition. So the, the last thing we did, so we had searched each of these libraries against the full DIA data set of, of individual cells from the aorta, and then breaking them down in sort of putatively labeling the cell types based on known marker proteins. Um, we can now quantify adipocytes, um, which previously we didn't have enough markers to, to, to look at. So the merging strategy introduced new markers that allowed us to look at adipocytes. Um, and we see uh, that for each of the given cell types, the addition of additional library um, searches uh, produces complementarity and eventually the, the, the main master merged library generates the most protein identifications per cell compared to any other individual library strategy. So um, this left us fairly confident and happy with our merged library approach for label-free um, DIA-based quantification of heterogeneous cells. Um, and then applying this, this is our initial pilot set with just, uh, you know, cells from one mouse, uh, no comparison here, but uh, just, just sort of examining the manually selected markers used to putatively phenotype the cell types. We, we see a very nice, unique expression of these marker types um, uh, across the, the labeled cell types. And then we applied, um, so this was sort of supervised classification of our cell types. Um, and this matches pretty nicely with what we would expect in terms of composition of the aorta cell types. And then we applied unsupervised clustering. So we did Leiden-based clustering with UMAP dimensionality reduction. This work was all led by Jesse Meyer and his um, postdoctoral fellow, Lex Hutton, in our group. So um, the clustering here produced eight different clusters of, of sort of distinct definable cell types. When we look at these clusters, um, we see, you know, we overlay these with our markers from the from the supervised analysis. We see pretty pretty good definition of the clusters, but into sort of macrophage types, fibroblast types, um, three different smooth muscle types, which starts to speak towards that intracell type heterogeneity, um, and also uh, sort of sort of clearly defined adipocyte types. Interestingly, here our endothelial cell type while showing pretty strong and distinct localized expression down at the tip of this cluster, didn't quite reach um, enough to, to completely segregate from that population of smooth muscle cells. Um, so, so this was sort of our initial descriptive analysis to prove to ourselves whether or not this approach was, was working in any biological meaningful way. And you know, so the net takeaway here was that, yes, I think we were able to start to glean some interesting biology from, from this analysis. Um, so next, the, the goal was to actually look at our, our mutant mice and, and their single cell proteome relative to our wild type mice. Because what's really fascinating here is that these cells, they all, they all come from litter mate mice who are essentially genetic clones of each other. The only difference between these mice is the presence of this one nucleotide change on the fibrillin 1 gene. So um, we were able to get nice data from almost 300 Marfan derived um, aortic cells and about 200 wild type derived aortic cells. When we first looked at the unsupervised clustering of the cell types, we see almost perfect separation of the Marfan and the wild type from each other, um, which, you know, maybe is to be expected. These are mutant mice, but it, it that makes it a little bit uh, complicated to try to do comparative analysis. So the next thing we did with Jesse and Lex is work on some different batch correction approaches to try to integrate the data sets a bit better, take, take out the batch effect um, so that we could do a little bit more analysis of Marfan or wild type cells in any one of these different clusters. Um, so we, 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 we took a bunch of different approaches used commonly in proteomics or RNA-seq. Um, and the one that we thought performed really the best at, at sort of reintegrating the data together and removing that main batch effect was the Scanorama approach, which was developed for single cell RNA-seq. So maybe not too surprising that it also performs really well on um, single cell proteomics. So using Scanorama batch corrected and quantified data, we then started to look into the actual uh, phenotypes of our single cell proteomes. Um, so I'm gonna look at first the, um, so on the left panel here, we have the unsupervised clustering uh, UMAP 
plots. And then at the top, you see the unsupervised clustering UMAP plot with the actual cell uh, putatively labeled cell based on marker expression um, overlaid on top of the of the light and base clustering. So um, to just sort of make the case that the manual marker selection uh, you know, has good fidelity across the different cell types. You see here um, at the adipocyte marker, um, macrophage markers, smooth muscle markers, endothelial markers, and fibroblast markers all show really nice dominant expression um, in their in their respect, the cells of their respective type and, and much lower marker expression across the other, uh, other marker types. Um, we see that there are at least three or uh, four different sort of putative smooth muscle types. You see dominant smooth muscle in a lot of these um, clusters over here. Um, a fibroblast cluster here, kind of a mixed endothelial adipocyte with some macrophage cluster here, and then a pretty messy cluster up here with macrophages, um, unidentified cells, and some smooth muscle cells as well. So, so kind of a, a, a bit of a mess here. Um, when we take this and look at the unsupervised cluster assignment and then remap our um, cell type markers, it helps us a little bit more with defining these clusters a bit more clearly. So um, when we now look at the Leiden clusters and marker expression profiles, uh, what jumped out at us was that there are four different smooth muscle types. We see very dominant smooth muscle marker protein expression in cluster one, which is this orange cluster here. We also see a uh, pretty good smooth muscle marker uh, expression in the uh, brown cluster down here. And then two other clusters showing some smooth muscle marker expressions, cluster six here and cluster seven here. Um, we also see two different fibroblast clusters, um, both uh, uh, here and here. We see strong expression of those fibroblast markers in both of those clusters. And then we see um, kind of a mixed adipocyte endothelial cluster here in cluster four. Um, now breaking this down by the proportion of cells and um, that we see between the wall tape and the mark end mice by initially by annotation. One of the things that jumps out at us is that there are um, there's quite an increase in the proportion of macrophage derived cell uh, types in the in the Marfan mouse aorta. We know that these aortas have quite a bit of inflammation, so this is this is corroborating known biology, which is kind of exciting. And then we look down into the um, proportion of cells based on the unsupervised clusters, where we can you know now break smooth muscle down into you know four different subtypes and fibroblasts into two different subtypes. And from here, we see actually an apparent reduction in the fibroblast cell types, um, an expansion of the uh, sort of that mixed confusing cluster zero. And really strikingly, we see a very big change in the proportion of this pink cluster, which is um, smooth muscle cluster six, this little guy up here. So um, looking a bit more into these smooth muscle clusters, we know that smooth muscle phenotype switching is a, is a really key event in pathogenesis. So we expect to see um, evidence of phenotype switching in these uh, different smooth muscle clusters. And part, you know, we're particularly interested in this uh, smooth muscle, modified smooth muscle cluster one, the pink cluster, because it shows a very big increase in proportion in the diseased mice. Um, so here we, we look at markers of quiescent and sort of normal smooth muscle cells. And in both the pink and green cluster, we see that these are dropping. Um, and then we can look at markers of, of sort of inflamed or secretory or activated smooth muscle cells. And now we see that in these two um, pink and green clusters that these markers are increasing. So uh, we've defined these, uh, these clusters as modified smooth muscle cells or activated smooth muscle cells. Um, and uh, and then the the brown and orange clusters are more of the normal quiescent uh, smooth muscle cell types. So then, uh, now that we sort of had our data described, we understood a little bit about the heterogeneity. The next question I wanted to ask of the data was, if we look at um, you know pro the the proteum of each cell um, across the different uh, phenotype defined clusters. Um, you know, what, what kind of overlap do we see proteomically? And what was interestingly, really interesting here is that um, 
when we look at all of the proteins identified per cell, we actually see quite a lot of proteins shared from, um, across all of the different uh, cell types that we observed. Um, the majority of proteins were actually shared, um, or there's a, a, a large proportion of proteins shared. But what really was interesting to me was that when we then looked at um, the pattern of sharing of differentially expressed proteins, essentially in response to the gene mutation, we see that there's very little sharing of differentially expressed proteins um, across the different functionally defined cell types. So um, most of the differentially expressed proteins are really only observed in one type or another. So we started to dig a bit more into this observation. We found that there were indeed proteins that were universally altered by the presence of the mutation in the aortic in the art of the, of the disease mice. So we see here keratin-7, which is actually a protein that can promote an uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition and um, is, a, is a poor prognostic indicator for cancer. Um, some cancer types is universally upregulated by the uh, mutation in all of the cell types that we observed. Uh, whereas this ribosomal splicing protein, SNRPE, uh, was universally downregulated in all of the cell types that, that were in our disease mice. But this wasn't true for all of the proteins. In fact, it wasn't true for the majority of the differentially expressed proteins. Um, and so there's some very interesting um, cell type selective uh, differential expression that we observed. Here's a redox related protein that really only seems to be upregulated in the fibroblast cell types. Um, and what was really interesting about this was our modified smooth muscle cluster seven also showed some evidence of differential expression in this protein. And if you look at that subtype, um, we actually see some expression of fibroblast markers in those in that particular smooth muscle cluster. And smooth muscle to fibroblast transition is one of the known phenotypic shifts that, that, that these cells can do. So, so we think that's really intriguing. And then another one that was really striking was um, the selective downregulation of ribosomal protein subunit six, which is a regulatory um, ribosomal subunit. And it's only downregulated in the adipo and the endothelial subtypes. And in fact, if you look at the expression of this protein in you know, effectively bulk data and we erase all sub, uh, cell type definition, we would never observe a difference in this protein because the, the proportion of adipocytes and endothelial cells in the data is much lower. Um, so this really highlights for me the value of looking at the single cell response to something like a gene mutation. Um, and, and I think the potential for these types of data as we go forward. Um, so to summarize, uh, our, our single cell proteomic analysis did capture known heterogeneity in, in aortic cell populations and has revealed some intriguing patterns of differential protein expression, um, both universally across cells and also unique to a handful of cell types. Um, our future studies, we want to expand this, expand this pilot work to more biological replicates because it doesn't mean a whole lot to us unless we can see it in several mice. Um, and then we're trying to increase our throughput in order to quantify more cells per mice. So back to that que the, the question of the day is how many cells is enough? Um, you know, we're certainly seeing really interesting biology with just 200 to 300 cells, but um, because we're getting pretty low representation of some of our more rare cell types and, and cell types like T cells, which are really rare in the aorta, we're not really getting, um, we'd like to expand the number to see if we can bring up more of the heterogeneity. And I think one of the technical takeaways um, from this work too, is just the importance of library generation um, for single cell proteomics and really making sure that the library represents the full heterogeneity of the system that you're studying um, and predicting this a priori may be kind of difficult um, but measuring it with DDA acquisitions may also have significant challenges, although I think we've seen some examples today, um, like Dr. Metzinger, um, that, uh, um, of, of maybe some workarounds where we can use DDA and, and classic database searching to define the cell types in the system. Um, so that uh, concludes my contribution for today, and I'll thank all of the people who really contributed to the generation of this work on the sample preparation side, our data acquisition side, data analysis, and then we have a whole team and ecosystem of folks at Cedars working to um, um, advance our single cell efforts. So thank you all for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for your talk. Uh, very interesting application to the complex uh, type of analysis of the tissue. It's very encouraging that we are moving towards the actual 
uh, cell to cell type of comparison. And I think it's one more thing would be uh, going towards that direction. I do have one comment from the chat. I would just uh, uh, basically read for you a part of it. I was wondering if you could use intermediate filament components ratios to gain more granularity with cell types and different uh, stages, uh, because uh, they are all uh, fly very well and highly abundant. And you should have uh, to be careful with keratins. There was just a comments about how you can uh, define uh, keratins between mice and student. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, keratin is always one that you look at with a little bit of extra scrutiny when you see it in your data. Certainly, um, but you know, keratins are also pretty well known to be involved in in the biology of, of vascular cell types. Um, so so we we kind of you know while yes we take them with a grain of salt we also know that that they are present and they are uh, they are regulating biology in the system. Um, and luckily, because we have mice, we can look at uh, overlap between the peptides of these keratins and and human sequences that could come from our fingers. So that's that's a good point. Um, and then, yeah, ratios of inter intermediate filaments and, you know, looking at the actual, some of the muscle contractile unit, it, this is something we have explored a bit. In fact, in the bioarchive paper, um, we, we, we looked into looking at the ratio of, um, of, of myofilament and, 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 and we didn't look at intermediate filaments in that one, but we could to, 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 because a lot of these ratios are pretty highly conserved in muscle cell types. So I think this is gonna be a really useful way to look into single cell data of muscle cell types and compare it to you know, other, um, other modalities. Um, but we haven't dug into it a great deal just yet in these smooth muscle populations. Sure. Uh, okay, I'm reading another question from the uh, question uh, part. It's probably not uh, very specific to you. It's more general. I'm glad people are fans of the cell one system, but it's pricey. Can you give uh, Can you give your option on where the field can make uh, strides on the lower cost option for the prep? I think that would be a general question for all uh, type of presenters. If anyone wants to jump in and answer that. Please uh, use use your microphone and use go. Well, I mean, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, we have we have used other setups, so we've used a, um, a an influx sorter that that does sort in a buffer that's compatible. Down, you know, you can use a, a very gentle MS compatible buffer to do the sorting, and it will sort in very low um, volumes into 384 well plates. And then you could use an alternative nanoflow liquid dispenser to do the, the, the all in 384 well prep. I mean, those are, those are possible. We have gotten our best results so far with cell in one, but, um, for somebody trying to get this set started at their institution without having access to that instrumentation, that could be a way to, to go about doing it. Okay. If anyone else wants to to answer as well, yeah, um, I would mind pitching in. Like, um, I you know, there's probably a, a flow cytometry core or service on on your, you know, at your university or or somewhere nearby. And I think if you go there and you really explain the problem to them, you, you'll be surprised by how good they can be. You know, and and we've got you know, I've, I've got a. A uh, guy who's been doing it for 40 years, uh, he's, when he retires, it w it'll hurt a lot, but you know, uh, 4,000 cells cost me $120 to have those sorted into plates. And, and, you know, once he understands the problem, it, it's really good. So that, that would be my, my two cents there. Yeah. I would echo uh, Ben's, uh, uh, basically definition about the fact sorter nowadays, they're very good. Uh, my previous lab had a three different types. I'm, I'm talking about the vendors and my current lab has a, a fourth type of vendor. I think all of them are being successful in sorting single cell, at least into the 384 plate format with certain uh, missing uh, points, but those missing points were very rare compared to other possibilities. That's why I think fact sort or sort to 384 plates and go to the either one part as has been presented today uh, or any other type of would be alternative way. In our lab, we're working with uh, uh, another vendor, Hewlett Packard, for another uh, cheaper sample preparation workflow. That's why there is a more and more uh, going on to the market uh, on the top of the cell, uh, cell one uh, system. And then, you know, probably uh, any other opinions. 
think I go very much in line with what Sarah was saying. We we tried a couple of different approaches. We also used the O2 uh, very O T2 very early on. Um, it's just that the most successful we have been within this L1. I'm I'm not saying that it's the only option, but for us at least, it works the most reproducibly, um, and currently is the best workflow. Okay. Uh, well, before we finish in this webinar, uh, I would like to have the last uh, question that I did, did ask the panelists, and some of them already answered. I could just read for you the answers. Uh, the, the question I asked was, you know, uh, in how many years do you think the single cell proteomic would be in par with the single cell RNA sequencing? And a couple of people uh, uh, applied. You know, Sarah did answer that it's two to three years. Uh, ben was uh, getting his bet on five years. My personal answer was uh, uh, as well as the SARS two to three years. If any other panelists who didn't uh, type the answer wants to add, please do now. Feel free to, to, to say what, what do you think about that question. Well, I guess we, are, we never go into millions of cells with proteomics but uh, we could get to where single cell proteomics was quite a while ago, I guess, indeed, in uh, two or three years. And uh, this would probably involve, carry with itself, a transformative improvement in what we can learn from the data. Okay. Manuel, what's your numbers? So, um, where I think the proteomic numbers um, have to go in the future. Um, I think that maybe four to 5,000 proteins can already be sufficient to draw radical conclusions, and that's somewhere where we are approaching now, right? So, um, I think that the field is now moving from pure method development and pure um, number games that we did in the past to real applications as we also see them um, in some of the talks today. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Then, uh, well, thank you very much, all panelists, for today's talk. There was a great uh, you know, overview of what the excitement is in the field. Hopefully, as we all agree in two to three years or maybe five years, each of the big institute will have on the top of their single cell RNA seq, we will have a single cell proteomic score, and then much more proteins will be measured than RNAs, especially if we could move uh, those budgets from RNA seq towards the proteins, we probably would reach it much faster. And uh, I would like to say thank you very much for everyone here who participated today. And I'm looking forward to meet and see you in the conferences and see how the field is moving. And thank you, Hupo, for the support of this initiative and probably see you all on the next one, which we're planning for the autumn of 2023. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.